Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. My name is Liz Demers. I'm on the partner team here at LinkedIn. And I am thrilled to welcome you to iHeart ABM, bringing sales and marketing together. We have an incredible group of marketers here today. Thank you so much for coming to spend some time on this Monday of Valentine's week. I see some panic in some of your eyes. Yes, Valentine's Day is on Wednesday. Please don't run to your florist. You have some time. And for those of you who don't celebrate Valentine's Day being a Hallmark holiday, it is also my birthday on Wednesday. So feel free to celebrate that. But no, 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 you don't have to get me anything. Your presence here is present enough. We have an incredible afternoon of content for you. We're going to go beyond the why of account-based marketing and really dig into the how. And to kick it off, I'm thrilled to welcome to the stage Anthony Ricciccato, the head of the partner team at LinkedIn, and uh, Eric Spett, the CEO of Terminus. Thanks. Um, it is Liz's birthday, and uh, it's very important to her. Just, just putting it out there. It's very important to her. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, I'm Anthony. Uh, I have the, uh, the privilege of, of working with our global partner team. And I wanted to spend just a minute talking about that. There, there aren't 100 slides. This will be relatively brief and painless. Um, but I think it's important to understand uh, that this partner initiative, the work that we're doing here today and that we're doing with partners all around the world, is, is really a strategic pillar for the LinkedIn Marketing Solutions Group uh, moving forward. Um, we have spent a lot of time really listening to what the market needs, trying to understand where we can help fill gaps. And LinkedIn is kind of a unique player in the overall marketing ecosystem. And it's clear to us that working with partners, some of which are, some of whom are competitors actually here in the room together, which is kind of an exciting thing for me, maybe not for you guys, but it is for me, um, to be able to work together to solve marketing problems, not just for the biggest brands in the world, and I think we often get lost in that, you know, how do we service Oracle or Amex, but for all of the brands who need to be connected to their consumers, to their customers, to partners. And that's really the underpinnings for the, uh, the global partner teams. We operate in Latin America, and Asia Pac, and EMEA, and North and South America. And as I was coming in this morning, it, it, I'm a kind of a crazy Olympics person, um, which is kind of an odd thing. But like any Olympic sport, I'm just nuts about suddenly. Like I watched the entire biathlon, like three hours. It was two different races. Like it's crazy. Um, and the, the thing that excites me about it is that the power that the Olympics has to convene efforts and people and sort of cuts across purposes and across all segmentations. Everyone comes and shows up. North Korea and South Korea showed up together to march together. And that's kind of heroic and exciting. Now, I know we're talking about marketing, maybe not quite as heroic as that. Um, but some of the things that we're doing here today of bringing people together are really important to our ecosystem. You know, LinkedIn is proud to be a, a player in, in what I like to call a clean, well-lighted space. You know what you're getting. We're transparent. You understand what, what's in it for us, what's in it for you. Um, and our ability to bring partners together to, to interact with our unique membership, our unique marketing opportunities is pretty exciting. Um, and, and it isn't lost on me that uh, partners like Terminus, uh, and some of the other folks, so Bombora in the room here, um, our, our friends at Bright Funnel, are all trying to solve these very complicated marketing problems that require us to work together, require us to maybe put aside, like, this is good for my company, this is good for my sale, this is good for my initiative, and focus on what's best for the customer. And that's really the heart and soul behind the LinkedIn Partner Marketing Organization uh, around the world, and super happy to have all of you here today. Now, with that said, one of our newest partners that uh, we brought on board um, is Terminus. And they're an account-based marketing firm, um, an ABM technology firm. I'm very excited to learn a new acronym at my advanced age. Um, and ABM is the next new thing that we're going to be learning about today. I'm thrilled. I've had the opportunity to spend some time with Eric and his team. And I've drafted off of that enthusiasm in many meetings. So I'm super excited to welcome Eric Spett, CEO of Terminus, to the stage to kick us off for the iHeart ABM. Hello, everybody. How are we doing? There we go. That was a lot of enthusiasm. I want to start by acknowledging that Anthony has a way cooler picture 
than I do. So I'm going to be working on that. Um, but I would really like to start first and foremost by thanking everyone who has come to join us today for being here. It is so awesome to see this many marketing and sales professionals fired up about ABM and learning more um, about how to do it and how to operationalize it. So we're going to talk a lot about that today. Uh, to echo what Anthony was sharing is it's really incredible what the team at LinkedIn has done. And so we have had good contacts and connections with LinkedIn uh, since the beginning of Terminus. And we've tried to build integrations and partnerships in the past. Um, but really, over the last six months, something that we've experienced, which has been incredible, is just a, a, a really great commitment to the partner ecosystem. And I think we all know and can agree that LinkedIn has the best B2B data in the world. There are great advertising products. And um, what a lot of B2B marketers have been looking for are better ways to operationalize it. And so uh, what has changed in LinkedIn and what we've experienced has been really, really incredible. All of the advertising products are now being built API first. And events like these are just showing LinkedIn's commitment to uh, partnering with companies like Terminus and many others, and ultimately just providing the best tools for B2B organizations. Uh, so we're very excited about that. A big thank you for LinkedIn for hosting the event today. And uh, for those of you not familiar with Terminus, we are the category leader in account-based marketing. And so we help hundreds of B2B companies and thousands of B2B marketing and sales professionals implement and execute account-based marketing. Uh, like so many, we have been through our own journey of this. It certainly has not always been easy. And um, many times, it didn't feel like there was much light at the end of the tunnel. And so you'll hear some of this today. But one thing that we're very proud of is over the last 12 months, uh, since implementing our ABM program, we have improved conversion rates from first demo to closed one by 124%, meaning that every single dollar in our pipeline is twice as valuable as it was a year ago. With that, our ACVs have gone up by 35%. We've shaved 20 days off of our sales cycle. And now our mission is to help everyone in this room, together with LinkedIn, educate about exactly how we did that. Because there were many points where we thought there was going to be a mutiny in the company. There's a lot of change. This stuff isn't easy. There's no real playbook for it. And so we are proud of the work that we've done. Again, it's a journey, so we're still uh, working through things every single day. But that's why we're here today, is to talk about the how and to help uh, educate everyone in this room on, on how to be a great ABM practitioners and great ABM organizations. And so with that, um, just a quick question to introduce our first speaker. Who is familiar with Flip My Funnel or has seen ABM described as a funnel upside down? All right. So we are thrilled to announce our first speaker today, who is uh, my co-founder at Terminus, one of my co-founders at Terminus, Sangram Badre. And uh, just a quick story with Sangram on how Flip My Funnel came about. So he was at the MarTech conference a few years ago. He came back into the office, super fired up. And this is not a pocket square. It's a napkin. And he had a napkin with a triangle drawn on it. And uh, just was sitting on the plane. Maybe he'll share a little bit more of this, but realized that um, this was the simplest way to describe ABM and to help companies go from a focus on quantity to a focus on quality. And so with that, um, we've been through a lot of journey into account-based marketing. And Sangram is going to share the top 10 lessons learned for ABM success. Thank you, guys. Awesome, dude. Fired up. This is fantastic. And what a location, what a facility. I cannot imagine that this is where we're doing this event. This is fantastic. So LinkedIn, again, thank you so much for having us here. So 10 lessons that we have learned from an account-based marketing perspective. And I cannot imagine being here and talking about this like literally a year or a year and a half ago. At that time, we we're still helping marketers understand why ABM is important. So raise of hands, how many of you guys are actually doing ABM? Wow, almost like 75, 80%. Now, that wasn't the case a year ago. And that has really changed. So for us, as Eric mentioned, that has changed for us quite a bit internally as well. So for me, I've been a marketer through and through. Before this, I ran marketing at Pardot, which went to the acquisition of Exact Target and Salesforce. And at that time, I realized we, we had the same challenge. And this challenge hasn't really changed for the last decade and a half of how marketing proves the value. Um, how many of you guys are in marketing? All right. How many of you guys are in sales? All right. So I would say that we all are in marketing and sales. 
right? At the end of the day, if you're in B2B, we all are in marketing and sales. There's no other way to look at it because at the end of the day, if marketing doesn't do what they need to do, the sales team is not gonna be successful. And if sales don't do what they do the best, marketing is gonna get fired. Right? If they don't close the deals, market is getting fired. No ifs and buts. No matter how good of a job you do as a marketer, it just happens, right? So the idea of sales and marketing to be too different is just not true anymore. If you really dig deep and figure out why things are not working, we'll figure out that because the alignment between sales and marketing is not working as well. So today, that's what we're going to talk about, how we, at Terminus, we have changed certain things and how we're looking at it. But as Eric said, with hundreds of customers, we have just realized that there are lessons that we can share with everybody as to how amazing organizations are doing account-based marketing. Right? Um, I also have started a crazy daily podcast. So if you guys want to learn and kind of be on the journey with us as to like how we're doing it, and we're talking about it for 10 minutes almost every day, we're like uncut, we're just talking about the challenges that we're facing, and we'll literally bring in a sales leader or a marketing leader and saying, what's the challenge today? What are we trying to do, and how are we solving? So it's literally an unfiltered way of knowing the journey of how we're doing account-based marketing and sales. All right, and this is, I call it dumb luck. Um, in 2015, I ended up writing a book on account-based marketing, and Wiley published it, and, and I feel this book is synthesis of almost 50 plus thought leaders out there in the marketplace trying to learn and do account-based marketing. So if you're new to account-based marketing, just stop by later on. We have copies of the book, and you can just uh, grab, a, grab a copy. Uh, but this is what, what Spet was mentioning about, the flipped funnel. So I'm not going to spend more time on it, and I'm so happy I'm not quite honestly, because I've talked about it for like two years, and it feels like I need to have a different talk track. Uh, my wife and kids were asking, like, is there anything else you talk about? And I, I just couldn't give them a good answer. So I'm really excited to talk about other things than what Flip My Funnel is. But at the highest level, it is challenging the status quo and the conventional wisdom around B2B marketing and sales. So the flipped funnel is a better way. And, and people recognize that. If it has to be a funnel, let it be a funnel, but let it be a better way of doing it. And at, at very fast, it's literally identifying the best fit accounts, then expanding your reach within those accounts so you're reaching to the right people in those accounts, then engaging people on their terms. As opposed to just emails and calls, we all engage on so many different ways and so many different layers. We need to be engaging people on their terms, turning them into advocates, and then finally measuring success. And what I'm about to share through the 10 different lessons we have learned is how you can do account-based marketing your own organization. All right, you guys ready for this? All right, well, let's do it. First question, how many of you have, and hear the question carefully, how many of you have lead executives on your sales team? Lead executives. It's not, yeah. It's, we all have account executives on the sales team. Nobody hires a lead executive. If you think about it, for 15 years, marketers have been sending leads to sales and saying sales don't get it. Well, sales always got it. They always hired account executives. We, as marketers, didn't get it. Like They do not focus on leads. They focus on accounts. So it was a big change and revelation that, wait a minute, we are behind the eight ball. We are not trying to understand how sales works in B2B. And the fact that we don't even have the same nomenclature really makes us think, like, wait a minute, where did we miss? So to me, we don't close leads. We close accounts. So yes, there are people, and we want to kind of engage with people on their terms. But at the end of the day, it's an account-based approach. That's how a salesperson things about closing a deal. If you tell, you're not closing Jen or Sally or Sangram or anything, they're closing LinkedIn or Coke or AT&T, like big companies, and in companies there are more people in the decision-making process. So that particular idea hopefully makes the point that ABM is here to stay and is the best way to get sales and marketing alignment. Make sense? All right, so 10 lessons. Number one, be brave. Now you might say, Sangram, what does that mean, right? Um, so the best way to put that out, I had to call in my son. Uh, he's seven-year-old. His name is Krish. And uh, a few weeks ago, he came out, and he said uh, he was wearing you know, like a, 
an amazing outfit, right? He has a football in his hand, and he has a baseball t-shirt, uh, a basketball shorts, and he's wearing terminus socks, which are really, really cool. Uh, but he thinks they're like football socks because they go all the way up, and, and tennis shoes. And he said, Papa, let's play. And I'm asking, like, what game are we going to play? Because I'm confused <laughs> uh, here, right? And he says, anything is possible, right? And I, to me, I want, I want to be like Krish when I grow up. Right? Because that's the, that's the idea. He had this innate sense of like anything is possible. Things can change and it doesn't have to be the same. And if, it, if that's how football is played, let's just come up with a new game. Right? He's ready for that. So for me, what, what it means for Be Brave as a marketer, now this is really important, is taking charge of accounts. If in your organization, sales team is coming with the list of accounts to market, that got to change. In modern organizations, what's happening is, Sales is helping, but marketers are the ones who are taking and coming up with the list of accounts to go after. So that is a big change, and that might take time, but that's what challenges the status quo mean. And more importantly, we all share the responsibility to teach others how account-based marketing is going to work. So we're going to go in deeper in it, but being brave really is that you're going to do something in your organization that hasn't been done for the last decade and a half. So you have to be brave because you're going to come up with new metrics, new way to measure, and new way to talk to your organization. Second one, form one team. You might say, again, this is one of those things like hashtag one team. Sounds really cool, right? And then sales and marketing coming together. But would we saw that, like Peter and Todd, who run sales and marketing at Terminus, they both are seven feet tall, and they do high fives, and I'm barely trying to kind of get in the, my hand in there, but I never get a chance to get there. But they actually are pulling together a true one team. It's a 100% transformation of our organization. And what's interesting is that they're not just talking about one team running around in the organization and saying, hey, we are one team, we are one team. They actually mean it. And here is what I mean when I say what they mean it. They have a mindset that this is how the organization should work. They believe that there's only one scorecard. Now, how many of you guys go in a sales and marketing meeting and spend the first 15, 20 minutes figuring out who has the right number? Right? Like, I can hear it, right? Like, there you go. We have that challenge. Like, the days of figuring out who has the right number has to be kicked out because that's where the challenge is. That means that we both are looking at things differently. And when you do, then half the time will be who's right, who's wrong, as opposed to what's right for the customer. And that's what ABM really does. So looking at a similar scorecard, and I'll give you an example of that in a little bit. And also, you have to operationalize it, right? Just saying one team and figuring out, hey, we are together and you know, going to beers out after, after the whole day is not one team. One team means you have operationalized it where you know what's working and what's not, and you're able to talk about it. If you do this, if you do this, this is what will happen in your organization. And these are real quotes from real people. So Todd and he looks just like that. Uh, he said, fire me if this doesn't work. Now note this, he didn't say fire the marketing team. He didn't say I have to get the marketing team to do something to get better. He said, fire me if this doesn't work. It's a real quote. Peter, who's a head of marketing, nobody's asking him how many leads you have generated this year, or this month, or this day, or this week. He's thinking about engagement and figuring out, and I'm gonna talk about engagement and what that means in a little bit as well. And the best one of all is Lucas, who is our VP of sales development. He's saying that four hours of every single day that their prospecting is happening in his team, that person is saving four hours every single day. Now, how many of you guys would like those kind of quotes in your organization? Right? I want to see it every single day, right? And that changes, right? So that's what you will find if a true one team really comes together. But that's hard to find. And that really starts with the leadership. So that's where the third point comes together. I wrote a blog post about this uh, like a few months ago, and, and Snowflake was one of the reasons why I wrote about it. It was because the CEO of that company was bought in. You know, the fist bump idea is really cool, but if your CEO is not bought into it, it's not going to work. Now, why CEO? There are so many different things marketers does. If you go to your CEO for every single tool, you know, you, you know, you're going to waste that person's time. Why ABM requires CEO's backing? Here's why. When you think about doing account-based marketing, you're essentially telling to your organization, to your board, to your marketing, to your sales department, that 
we no longer have to get thousands of leads in top of the funnel. Well, if you're gonna say that, the spreadsheet that your finance team is putting together that shows how many leads converts at how what ratio is gonna convert to what many customers is gonna break. If you go and tell your organization that instead of 1,000 accounts or 1,000 leads, I'm gonna only focus on 100 accounts. It's not gonna work unless your organization is ready and matured enough to think about it. So from a CEO perspective, why this is important is because your CEO has to support this initiative. This is one of the very key initiatives where you need to get your CEO and your board and your executive team to buy into this because it's not a one person job. It's not about being a superhero in your organization. It is about being truly one team. And we have seen many organizations fail because they only, it was only a marketing initiative or only a sales initiative. And I say that with a lot of love and humility that spend the time you need to get buying internally to do account based marketing. Without that, you're gonna be really challenged and we have seen amazing marketers being really challenged because they couldn't get their CEO to buy into this idea. And I'm not saying to transform and stop everything you're doing, I'm just saying make sure that your CEO buys into this idea of piloting an ABM program and what strategy, all right? All right, now if you're gonna do that, let's say you're one team, you're brave, your CEO is backing you, now the question becomes, what do you measure? What are you gonna talk about, right? And how are you gonna show success? So we believe that engagement is the new measurement. And the reason we say that is because engagement might sound fluffy, like what is engagement, and we're gonna dive into that in a second, but at the end of the day, if people are spending time with you on a one-on-one -on -one conversation at an event like this, or on your website, if they are the right accounts, then that engagement matters. And we can no longer ignore that. The number of downloads, the number of leads may not actually show the actual validation that they're interested, but if they're spending time with you, that clearly shows that they're engaged and they're interested in what you have to say. So engagement, we believe, is the new measurement. Well, if it's a new metric, you need to stop doing certain things in order to do some new things. I firmly believe that. Because what I've always happened is, um, whenever we try to do new things, something else falls off. So we have to make this conscious choice of what are we gonna stop doing and start doing. Now, in my family, uh, my wife and I would share and we'll always talk about, all right, if, you, so if I'm gonna run an errand or if I'm gonna do buy something, then what am I gonna buy and what is she gonna buy? And sometimes for holidays and things like that, I mess up. Um, I try to buy the wrong thing of the wrong size from the wrong store for all the wrong reasons. And, and she would always have this list for me saying that, well, here's exactly what you need to do and I'll still mess up. Um, and the greatest part that I feel that I can do based on the stop and start, I always tell her what not to buy. Give me that list because I will be better off when I know what not to buy too. So she will always help me with, well, here's what you gotta buy, but here's what you don't buy. And that helps. But in organizations, when you have so many metrics that you're measuring, you need to know which one to focus on. Here is an example, I know it's an eye chart, you can, you can take a photo of it if you want to, to just kind of have, have it for you, but this is an example of a scorecard. The most important part of this scorecard is the idea of tiering. Now, how many of you guys do tiering in your accounts when you do account-based marketing? All right, I see some of you guys. I think if you want to take anything from this presentation, outside of my kid being super brave, uh, is the idea of tiering. This, this idea to, to make sure that you're focused on the right accounts is incredibly important. And you can do the same thing to each and every account. That's saying that every lead is equal, every account is equal, that's not true. If you're selling to an account that's half a million dollar deal and there's another account that's $10,000, you cannot do the same tactics. You don't want to do the same tactics with each one of those. So tiering accounts really helps you figure out what to focus on and then you start measuring, if you look at all the different ways you can measure, you can really look at engagement per account. So tiering becomes a really, really good way to measure it. And this is the scorecard, it's an example that you can go to that sales and marketing meeting and show, here's what we're measuring. Here's what our engagement looks like in tier one accounts, here's how tier two accounts are working, here's what we plan to do in tier three accounts. Your sales and marketing team now can start from a common place, not based on leads, but based on the accounts you want to go after. All right, so I want to add to this part, and this, is, this gets me excited, fired up, big time. ABM is more bigger than demand generation. 
I feel like marketing has been boxed into this idea of demand generation. How many of you guys feel like marketing is your job and your company is demand generation? Almost, almost everybody, right? So here is the seven strategies that we put out there. Another very quick review on this one is marketing doesn't have to focus on demand generation as the only way to run marketing. What ABM allows you to do is focus on beyond demand generation. Let me give an example. Um, let's say almost every single organization has pipeline challenges. And if they don't, if they're smart enough, they will figure out a pipeline challenge because the more efficient your pipeline is, the better your business is. That's the health of the business, right? So let's say your pipeline, you have a ton of pipeline and your win rate is, let's say, 20%. And if you can improve that win rate by five more percent, that could mean millions of dollars for your organization. It's a perfect use case from an ABM perspective because the accounts are already identified, they've already raised their hand and said they're ready to buy. They're gonna buy from you or they're gonna buy from your competitor and you already know what the sales cycle looks like. So you can literally go to your sales team and say, hey, I wanna do a pilot program on our accounts that are in pipeline that you're gonna close in the next 30 days and let me work with you to figure out how do I engage with them on their terms. Another example is upsell and cross sell. Um, how many of you guys have more than one product that you sell? Ton of you guys, right? So that, those accounts are already identified. So you can literally run an ABM play on those accounts to upsell and cross sell to different business units within the same organization. So what ABM allows you to do as a marketer, and this is what gets me really excited, is it allows you to have a broader conversation in the organization to drive revenue. Cool? All right, this is another big part of it. If anybody felt just because we're here, we're at LinkedIn, um, Terminus is here, and if anybody thought that advertising is the only thing that ABM is all about, you got it wrong. And, and we, have done a, we haven't done a good job of sharing all the different things today. So at the end of the day, you shouldn't feel advertising through LinkedIn and Terminus is the only way to do ABM. As a matter of fact, when we started early on, I created this chart, it's like a year old, where we mapped out all the different strategies that we did from a marketing perspective. I bet you guys, when you go back, and if you want to do this low, tech to, low touch to high touch, high tech to low tech, and say, what are all my strategies that fit in each one of those? You're gonna find that there are a ton of things that you do as a marketer, ton. But not all strategies are equal, and when you go back to the tiering of accounts, you don't want to do the same strategies. You don't want to necessarily have the same level of involvement with all the accounts that you are tiered. So when you think about tactics for marketing and sales perspective, we need to focus on the right strategies and the right tactics. Now seven, data driven. You might say, well Sangram, we get it, it's exciting, there's so many different things, but how do I do it? So Peter, who runs marketing at Terminus, came up with this incredible idea of how do you operationalize ABM? And it's very simple, fit, intent, and engagement. Idea is find the right accounts, see if they're surging, and then start engaging with them. Now I'll give you a real art tech stack as to how we do that. And we're gonna just expose for the very first time our own tech stack so you can see how we do account-based marketing. This is Terminus ABM tech stack. You remember all the five stages for Flip Funnel: identify, expand, engage, advocate, and measure. And as I just said, if you came out of this meeting this, this today and said that, hey, we, we need to use Terminus or we need to use LinkedIn to do it, and that's all, then we definitely didn't do a good job of educating uh, on many different things. We ourselves use 20 plus tools to do account-based marketing, but we do it in a way where we know what we're trying to do and which accounts we're going after. We're trying to identify the right account, we're trying to reach within those accounts, very specifically through all these different channels, we're then turning them into advocates, and then we're measuring success in a very clear way. It allows us to create that scoreboard and share that in a very profound way. I'm gonna skip through, through this one real quick in the interest of time, uh, but there's an idea of doing ABM in sprints. As I said, if we are doing ABM, it's not about jumping in with two feet and saying this is all we're gonna do. You have to start in sprints, and the way I think about it, that you have to start, learn, adapt, and keep going. I remember when Peter came out on board and he said, hey, we're gonna do this thing. We said, well, um, all right, what's the plan? And he said, here's the plan, but let me tell you, in five days the plan is gonna completely change and then we're gonna figure out what's gonna work and we're gonna focus on that. So the idea is to start somewhere. And ABM could be very crazy where you might think you need everything in the world, 
but you need to kind of really focus on what do you want to start. All right, so I want to kind of finish off with this thought. Of, at the end of the day, all we're doing is for customers. And if you want to make our customers hero, what would we do? So I came up with this uh, chart um, almost a year ago, right before Christmas, and, and I said, well, if I want to be emotionally involved with this idea of customer heroism, I need to kind of figure out a way to do this at home. So I essentially invited my wife to be part of it because I don't want her to ever fire me. Um, and, and I want her to know that I love her and I want to figure out what works, what doesn't work um, in 12 years of marriage. So I put her at the center and I went through this exercise with her. I was very excited and I started with like the basics, said, oh, I'm gonna do, you know, how about this? Like I'll, I'll clean cars, I'll do pay the bills and, and, and do all the basic stuff. And then she's like, yeah, please do that. Like I don't wanna worry about that. I'm like, okay, that's good. And then I got courageous and then I said, hey, and uh, what do you want uh, for Christmas? And she said, 12 years of marriage, you don't know what I want? Like, what's wrong with you? So that didn't really go well. So I, like, I had to dig myself out of that and figure out what do I do now? So then I said, well, you know, what about this? Like, she works, I work, we both work. So over the weekends, I try to be mom and dad and give you some space. And she said, yeah, that's a must do. That's, that, that can have real impact on our relationship. I'm like, well, that's good. I'm, again, re-emerging, uh, having some confidence here. And then... Um, she said, hey, you know what, um, you know, I'm the best dishwasher, by the way, in my house. Uh, there's no better, better person who washes dishes better than me. And, but I have a problem of like, waiting until the very end uh, of the day. And so it all piles up. And she hates seeing a piled up sink. So whenever she's out, if I can wash the dishes when she comes home and doesn't see it, it'll be awesome. Okay, I can do that. But what was very interesting, and it's, it's, it's probably really relevant now, is she said, hey, when you get me flowers on a random Wednesday is the best thing. And I'm like, you don't even like flowers. <laughs> and she said, well, it's not that. It's the thought that you care enough about me and that you would do it on a random day, right? So if you think about all of these and say, you know what? I want to put my customer in the center, and I want to focus on that. And, and you might be doing all kinds of activities today to kind of engage with them on many different channels, and you might be able to engage with them so well that you might think that there is something really interesting here and your customer might care about you. But at the end of the day, if all these tactics that you're doing that may or may not work, the question for you really is, and that's what I want to leave you guys with today, is this. What if, what if you stopped everything doing in this quadrant of should do and low impact? And to me, that's what EBM really is. You might be sending a ton of emails, you may be having a ton of communications, you may be doing, writing a ton of blogs, but if that's not reaching to your customer, then is that worth doing it? And then the bigger question is, what if you really started to focus on the big ideas, the things that really matter to your customer? What would that do? What kind of programs would you run? How would you tier accounts? Instead of waiting on every single lead to come in and, and come in the funnel, would you actually focus on a few? And if you did that, what kind of content will you create? Would it, will the content be more specific, more personal, more human, uh, more relevant? Or would the content be just a gen generic content? What will happen? So I'm going to leave you guys with this today. Is at the end of the day, ABM, the whole idea of sales and marketing together, one team, being brave, uh, making sure you have buy-in from your entire organization, especially executive team, all of these come down to a really simple thing. And that is, do you really care about your customer. That's it. Thank you. All right. So I'm super excited to introduce a real dear friend of mine uh, for the next session. So um, I know Craig Rosenberg, and uh, most of you guys probably know him. He is the chief analyst at Topo. And Craig and I have been known each other for probably three, four years now. And what's interesting about Craig is, and you'll see in his presentation and everything as he does, is that he, is, he has incredibly amazing ideas around how things should be done, and he's very data-driven that allows you to kind of recognize what works and what doesn't. And if you are looking for true use cases of how account-based marketing is done at all levels of organization, this is your session. So please help me welcome Craig Rosenberg. All right. 
I didn't know what to do. That intro was so great. I wasn't sure if I should wait and then walk up or I had to come and like look at him like that as he did. I did the other. By the way, I do, Sangram, the most important thanks I can give you is that you skipped the picture of me. I really appreciate that. I hope nobody caught that. And I just want you to know if you did, the camera adds 45, 50 pounds. And just weird skin coloring and bloating and stuff. I'm not sure where you got that picture, but it was brutal. So anyway, I'm really excited to be here, you guys. And uh, it's a big crowd. It was fun. You know, you, you know, I do this speaking circuit thing, and I love watching the, the, the crowd roll in and things unfold. I knew this was going to be big. It's a lot of people here today. And it was really cool when Sangram did the hand pull and everyone's um, jumping off the, uh, jumping into the account-based pool. And so it's, you know, I'm excited to talk about it because I've been talking about this thing for two and a half years and it's so different now when you go to conferences or you know, any of us who have been in the game, you go talk to customers, prospects, you go to events and whatever, how much we've all evolved if we started to wrap our hands around account-based. So anyway, it's, uh, it's, uh, I'm really excited to be here today. So <clears throat> what I wanted to do was talk about a few use cases here that we've seen over the last year. I'm going to also give you some of my take on account base, and then we'll talk about um, some of the cool things that we've seen people do throughout the year. So, um, well, I, that was my intro to my intro. So the first we'll talk about Topo and myself, uh, and then we'll do a quick intro to account base. There's four use cases now after uh, great deliberation pre-presentation, and then it says discussion throughout the presentation. That's wrong. That just means if you no longer want to pay attention to me and just want to kick in your own discussions, please feel free. <laughs> so anyway, let me tell you about Topo just for one sec. So the reason it's important is, A, I got two sales guys here who want to sell you stuff. Wink, wink. I'm just kidding. Oh, three. I just saw the other one. No, actually, I just want everyone to know what our background is. So we, got, we study high growth companies across marketing, sales development, and sales, and then you know, uh, we, we have a variety of products that spin out of that. So we have playbooks where we come in and have a consulting team that can work with you. We have advisory and membership. Uh, annual, uh, it's an annual deal with us where you can come in and have our analysts work with you based on the data that we're finding. Then we have uh, big events as well. The sales development, demand gen, sales background of the company, that maps to mine. So I'm the chief analyst and co-founder of the company. My background's in sales and marketing. I just saw uh, a customer walked in who's a CMO at a sales tech company. He said, oh my God, you talk about everything. And uh, it's, you know, it's just one of those things. I've, my background has been across the entire funnel. I think that's really important as we talk about account-based. I'm not in the micro marketing ivory tower. Right? I'm in the real where I, on Friday I had three meetings with sales leaders and today I'm talking to marketers. That perspective is going to be really important as we continue to talk about account based. So let's talk about my view of, of the world on account based or our view, Topo. That, that was egotistical of me, but uh, you'll see. I'll throw in things about that make me look really good throughout the pre -zap. So the, um, when we launched into account based, this was about two and a half, three years ago. Well, actually, we launched marketing, and the, the, what we said was there's a bet here, it's in a, and it's that the world is going to account-based. It's easy to say now, right? What a great bet. But it, it's true. You know, we really, you know, as you, as you just heard from me, we came from sales. We came from sales development. We came from marketing. We saw this thing happening. And frankly, I think, you know, when we, when we did it, initially we went in and we said, well, what's happening today? And two and a half, three years ago, I think, you know, we all think of this as new, but actually we found a lot of programs that had been around for a long time. Did they call it ABM? Maybe not. Might have been just their enterprise or field marketing. Might have just been that they were very targeted. Now we've got this wrapper around it. But look, when we launched, we saw programs that were working. And what did we learn right away? What we learned right away is the most important thing I can tell you right now is that account-based, ABM, whatever you want to call it, it's a business decision. It just, I, I know we got to do tests. I know we got to call it campaigns. I know that stuff. I get it, all right? I work with customers all the time to do it. But this is a business decision that should come from the top or be confirmed from the top. And when we treat it like a toy, or treat it like a thing, or treat it like, you know, hey, we're going to go test that. We do all the stuff. Let's go test out an ABM campaign. That's where it gets a little tricky, guys. Because the most important thing starts with the fact that we have determined as an organization 
that there's a targeted set of accounts that are better than others for us to go after. And we start there. I don't know what the number is for your company, but it's really interesting for a lot of you. It could be deal size, it could be close rates, it could be churn, I don't know. It could just be want. It could be a prediction, right? But the, the fact is, is that we are gonna start with this idea that we are going to take a set of target accounts and then we're gonna mobilize the whole organization, anybody who touches the customer, and I have four here, but you know, product, exec, you name it, they're on top of this. And we are gonna go and we are gonna to work together and we are gonna coordinate personalized, high value engagement and then ultimately revenue and upsell at these targeted set of accounts. You know, when people ask me what's the biggest thing I learned, it's not in the data. In the last year and a half, I learned something really interesting, which was if the VP of sales and the CEO don't say, if you get us into those accounts, we got it, it's not gonna work. It doesn't show up in the data, but it's true. Because we go in, there's all these weird things, you know, let's go into account base so we can get better leads. <sighs> oh man, you're dead, right? You are. What you need is for someone to say, Yes, these are the target accounts I want. You just, you get, you engage with them, you show me, you get us in the door, we got it. Now granted, we're gonna help, right? But that mentality is one of the most important things and what that reflects is when we go into account based, it's gotta come from everyone, right? So a lot of you guys run data to figure out your target accounts, that's great. But still, that the, Everyone needs to look at it and look at the actual target accounts and say, yes, I get it and let's go. And that's part of what we're trying to do here. It's a business decision. It's a collaborative business decision. And I'm telling you right now, it will be if your business, right, it can't sell to everyone, which by the way is everyone, just don't tell anybody, then account-based is going to be, some version of this is going to be right for you. It's that simple. So let's just look at uh, our, my view of where we were before and where we go now. <clears throat> so I'm sure you're gonna hear throughout, I, you know, I, I talk a lot about targeting. I just went on this huge rant here. I was about to say, all right, we're done. Because that is, I mean, that's everything. But let's just start with this idea of the ideal customer profile. You know, when we, when we, were, when we go to market and we pitch investors or we're talking to the capital markets or whatever, we wanna look big. You know, many people use TAM in the wrong way. TAM's a number, you know, but many people call it target market, whatever. Well, let's just put the two together. You want to go big. You need to go pick, oh my God, we got this huge market. But the key to account base is to take that target market and identify the ideal customer profile. And the word strict is very important. We're going to focus on them. That's often hard for people. Where's Israq? I was just talking to him today. We were talking about this first step that this old company used to work at. First step was they were maniacally focused on a certain type of account. That's the ideal customer profile. They could have sold to a lot of companies and they're strict about who they focus on and where they put their resources. The other thing has been a process change. And actually, if you look at it, most of the other status quo versus account, they correlate to, with each other. So the first thing is, we did this amazing thing for, call it 10, 15 years. We, we had this laddered waterfall or a supply chain for revenue. And we had organization, we broke the organization up and, fun, and functions would take what they did and they'd throw it just a little hop over this little wall. The next person would catch it, they would convert it, they'd throw it over a wall, right? That person would catch it, we'd throw it all, the, and we end up in account management or whatever. So, and that was good, by the way. Because anybody who's my age knows for a long time, it was just really hard to be a marketer. Because, I mean, it, it was, we, we just, we didn't have a scoreboard. We had to plead, we had to show, we had to say, ooh, this picture's really cool, right? And it was just really hard. Then we got a scoreboard, it was great, and this, this, this ability to break things up by functions was really powerful. But now we've got this targeted set of accounts, we're going in account base, and now we have to integrate. Now we have to say, well, we're gonna break down the wall, we're gonna take a common metric and we're gonna go after it. That's different. Because I gotta tell you guys all in marketing, the, the great thing about the MQL, the lead, the inquiry, whatever you call it, was you were able to get something on the scoreboard. The bad thing is, was it defined our self-worth. 
We had to do everything to get someone to fill out a form. What the heck? So you get a, you know, we, we set someone up with an executive VP. They have a conversation, but they didn't fill out a form. So it's not an MQL. It doesn't count, right? That's why we're here. We're going to figure out who these target accounts are. We're going to knock down walls, and we're going to get after it. And that's why organizationally, we don't want to leave marketing in isolation. We don't want to leave sales development in isolation. We want to get all hands on deck and go after these guys. The tactics are changing, and that's partly what you guys are here to do. But on the other hand, I got to tell you guys, it's just a lot of the tactics you can use are just remixed into, into a more high value motion. The issue was, was that everything we did in a volume based marketing program was to get the most people. And now we have to look at it from a marketing perspective and get those people. And when you think about it that way, instead of you know, something really big, a webinar, we want 4,000 people there. That 4,000 people doesn't matter unless X amount come from those target accounts. So with that, we have to figure out what are the best, most valuable ways that we can engage with those folks and how can we do it in an orchestrated way? A perfect example of that is you might invite people to that webinar, but instead of caring if they come, the fact that we have all these other motions that go along with it they ultimately might become an opportunity, whether they go to the webinar or not. Obviously, it's better if they do. Don't get me wrong. So that's how we have to start thinking about our tactics. The final thing is, you know, it's on my, <clears throat> the theme, as I said, these are all intermixed. But the, the leads, MQLs, et cetera, that was the, the metric for marketing and demand gen. We believe that metric has changed, and it's what we call TAP, Target Account Pipeline. So. Not all pipelines created equal, otherwise don't do account-based. Because the most important thing I talked about in the front is we are gonna determine a set of target accounts that are better than anything that we could possibly spend time on. What we wanna track is how much of that pipeline do we create. And one of, the, one of the reasons, this is awesome, do you see how I did that? <laughs> yeah. um, so I don't know, what was I, uh, anyway, so the, uh, <laughs> but look, I just, the, the big thing here is when you looked at the, when, when we started this account-based journey, when we looked at, we did our target accounts and we looked at pipeline, for most of you saw about 15, 20% of target accounts were coming through your standard demand gen. That's a good baseline to go lift against, right? And then we put all of our <laughs> resources, <laughs> someone's messing with me. This reminds me in college, there was this band, it was my friend's brother who always played and they were terrible. So what we'd do is we'd go unplug them in the back and be like, electricity's out, sorry, you gotta get down. So anyway, whoever's hinting at me, I'm gonna keep going just for a little bit longer. So you get the idea, all right? You get the idea. The game's changed, we know that. It's important for us to be thinking about the core things that we need to go do, which is target account, pipeline, and the funnel, I don't have the same funnel as Sangram. I have my funnel, our funnel. And I just want to point out a couple things because it's very, uh, it could take days for us to go talk about, which if you're interested in, just talk to one of my sales guys here in the room. I'm just kidding, that was a bad joke. All right, so a couple things I want to point out. So one is everything starts on the left with the ideal customer profile, the ICP. That is everything, I keep mentioning it. What am I gonna do here, guys? The other one is a target account list. You know, it's funny that analysts on my team keep saying, the target account list is strategic, Craig. It took them a year and a half to convince me of this because I kept saying, no, it's not. It's a list. They said, and now I get it because the target account list in account-based is your target market. You have to actually look at it. You got to get in a room. You can't just look at the definition. You got to go and look and say, yes, these are the accounts. The other thing you'll see is we knocked out lead. It doesn't mean leads aren't important. Please don't go tell us, say, Craig didn't say leads are important. Leads are part of it. But as Sangram said, it's engagement, and it's engagement starts at the top and rolls all the way through lifetime value, and that's very important. Because I'm telling you, we got to, as marketers, most of you are in marketers in here. I saw a bunch of salespeople raise their hands. Thank you for being here with us today. But the idea here is that marketing can add so much value to the entire process Okay, if we just think it selfishly, let's track that. If we just think about it for the right thing for the account, we need that. 
right? Why would we hand it off to sales and, you know, and then they go through the process, they're getting yelled at by their regional sales leader, what, you know, where is it, where is it, where is it, instead of saying, across the entire life cycle, here's all the things we will do as a group in order to not just get them engaged, but to drive home business. The final thing I'll mention is account-based is about LTV. It's about expansion, it's about potential account revenue and, and hitting that. And for a lot of people in B2B, where it's net, you know, it was very net new centric. Everything we did was because we were reporting lots of net new, and then we let everything sort of sort themselves out on the back end, right? Instead of thinking about the entire life cycle. In account based, we're thinking about the entire life cycle. And there's some really powerful stuff. I'll give you a use case about it in a little bit. Okay, so I can't spend a ton of time on this. But I had to tell everyone, we have an account-based technology stack. We just went through our account-based uh, tech research, and we're starting to put everything together here today. I figured I would show it to you guys, but not spend a ton of time on it. I will just mention a, a couple things. Uh, the, the, the stack in and of itself is actually, everyone tells me how daunting it is, I think because everyone's using account-based in their branding. But actually, when you take a step back and look at it, it's, it's, it's actually manageable. It's manageable to go look at and figure out what you want to go do. Okay, so look, we can spend a lot of time. I'll just tell you a couple things. One is, uh, you know, infrastructure starting at the bottom. There are new things emerging around what we're calling the account-based platform. It's what everyone has asked for that we have that sort of marketing automation for account-based. And that is, as the vendors are starting to lay groundwork for that, that should be really exciting for all of us as marketers. We believe the biggest issue, and you know, when I was telling whoever it was today and wanted to do AI, wanted to do any of these fun things, is the data. The data is a problem, so it's not just about buying the data, but it's about how you make that data come together into one unified database. And then as we keep going up, you'll see we end up in tactics. Okay, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it. I didn't want to show it to you a bunch of you took pictures. That's fine, but I did want to say that the two points on the on the stack. The first thing you do in account base is you figure out the strategy and what you want to go do. The stack comes next. The stack can support most of everything you want to go do. Don't get me wrong, I am not one of those people are saying, I am huge into tech. The issue is, is you don't do it the other way. You don't call the ABM tech vendor and say, I want to do ABM. Can you, can you sell me something? You come in and you talk to them and say, here's our strategy. Here's what I want to do and I want to create a platform to support it. Okay, and it can be done. It's starting to really straighten itself out. It's really not that, I mean, there, there's not a lot on here. I could have dazzled you with the Brinker slide and had 5,000 things on here, but it's just not real. This is, we are coming, it's, this thing's gelling together and it's, it's very workable. All right, so let's do some use case. So what I did on the use, what we do on the, we have about 30 use cases on file. We keep adding them each week. It's been a really important thing for us is to, is to take qualitative information because what we learn from the market is there's data, but what people really want are stories. The other thing we learned though as I started to present these is I have to protect the innocent. And so even when people said, hey, you can use our name, it still got a little true. So what we do is we have the use cases. I did flip, uh, you know, we, we do map, uh, take out some of the tools and mix it up so nobody can figure out who's who and what's what. The story's still the same. And the most, most of them came out recently, and so I just want to walk you through it. This fun stuff. So this one, literally, we just met with them a week ago, and uh, it's the story we saw across IT and security companies where they were getting lots of leads, lots of leads. SDR program usually was doing better, but in this, in this case, most recently, it was, uh, I think, you know, six or seven meetings a month, and sales hadn't hit quota in a long time. So when they looked at everything that they were trying to do, you know, we could go and say, well, it's, it's all account-based, right? There's this big thing, there's all these levers we gotta pull, but actually the most important thing was, can we just define our ICP? Can we just figure out who is gonna be better than others? And when we look at the leads and we look at what converts and what doesn't convert, you know, what's gonna come out? So when they did, they looked at and they saw ver this, this ver these verticals in IT and security and whatever have been across the board. I see this all the time where people sort of figure out a set of six verticals and they focus all of their efforts against that. And then we talked about tiering. So I want to encourage you guys on this. So someone asked me before, do you expect people to read this? No, but this is the most 
uh, tangible tool that you could take home with you because this is the next step for many of you. You define the ICP and Sangram's point and his last thing was you got to tier it. You don't just got to tier it. You got to figure out what you're going to do against it. And that's where you start to have some fun and get really, really granular and you start to figure out the life cycle against these accounts and you have to do it against tiers. If not, you're crazy. The fr I'll tell you right now, do this exercise. Go through, take the tiers and walk through everything. Marketing, sales development, sales, CS. Figure out who's going to touch what. Figure out what they're going to say. Figure out how custom it's going to be. Figure out how much you want to spend. All the everything. Just figure it out. And just write it up on the wall. I guarantee if you don't think you want to uh, segment your tiers, you will then. Because you'll realize you can't do it all. And you're going to have to figure out what you want to do. For those of you who have figured it out and you know you want to go in a tiered approach, it's not just about tiering. It's about creating a go-to-market that's different against each segment. So for those of you who are really enterprise heavy, right, and you want to go into the big, you're whale hunting, seven-figure deals, A is the place for you. You're going to be very, very custom. And you are going to throw the book at these deals. I mean, there's plays in here that should be wait in the parking lot until the buyer comes out, right? <laughs> Leave leaflets in the parking lot. I don't know. We can talk about those guerrilla tactics later. Uh, you know, if you're, we, we are running into a lot of companies that are actually volume and velocity, account based volume and velocity. So, but they, the same thing, realization we all came to, but ACV is like 20, 30. So there's all this action happening. They're really a BC, so they got a lot of outbound SDRs, but they're really not, there's not enough of a, of a nut there for them to do 100% custom. They can make really good decisions against the Bs and the Cs. You know, I gotta tell you, it's so amazing to go through this process, and I gave you this example here because the first step was to define the ICP, figure out what it is. Then we gotta go figure out how we go to market, and I'm telling you right now, the exercise, it's not simple. You gotta put everyone in a room, you got to either have whiteboards around the room or paper around the room, then you got to go write it out. And it's really powerful. It doesn't look powerful, but it is. Well, I mean, it looks powerful. It's just hard to read. You guys can ask for the slides later. So, the, uh, so when you think about it, you know, we had these, a lot of our IT and uh, security guys that I've been looking at, they do uh, verticalization as their strategy. I'll tell you right now, that's changing with intent data and engagement data, which you guys talked about before. People are using that to select who they're going to go after. But basically, to keep things simple, they roll vertical campaigns out on a, on a quarterly basis. That allows them to be really, really simple in how they approach things. So it, you know, I'll just give you a couple things. We've seen this across the board. These Results happen all the time when people who have a, they're in a market that is understood, so product market fit against the market is already there, and they just got to figure out who they target. You know, uh, SDR output is increased by just verticalizing the SDRs, getting them focused. Marketing spend is put to the right place, right? And so you'll see higher rate of target account pipeline with less spend. The other thing is, you know, sales will be happy, I'm telling you. Sales can't always tell you. That's the thing you got to know. I know I did this thing, well, sales says I got it, but you have to help them because when you say, hey, what are your best accounts? Uh, that can, that, well, you can do that for fun. Just go say, what are your best accounts? You will get the top 50 list from their region, right? Then you got to go, well, let's dig in a little bit. Let's look at what you, where you've closed. And then once you've sort of gotten that, and then you start to say, okay, well, here are the target accounts that you're best at. And then you show them that you got that. They're going to be happy, but more importantly, they're going to close more business. All right, use case two is the hyper-targeted program. So uh, this one is one of my favorites because uh, not a ton of resources, very targeted. So for those of you who have a very tight target market, this was a CPG-focused company. We're talking about 50 target accounts, really nine. Anybody who sold the CPG, you know the drill, right? There's nine. Maybe you'd probably tell me there's not even nine. So you had big numbers to hit, but you've had... Uh, not just big numbers to hit, they had big numbers. They were getting lots of leads. SDRs were doing like 25, 30 meetings a month with nothing to show for it. That's crazy. 25, 30 meetings a month and they had nothing from it. So you go in, you look at the numbers. We can benchmark what we want, but the, the benchmark of the meetings was fine. Was the benchmark of the conversion was terrible. Marketing was getting lots of leads. Nobody was working with each other because everything, the easiest place to go was outside the ICP. It was way easier to get numbers if you didn't go after the top 50 or nine. 
So what they do, you know, I got to tell you, the, the biggest thing we've learned on the orchestration side is that marketing and SDR should go to market together, and that's the first thing you do. So we're going to get up here, we're going to be alignment, right? Then you go in and go meet with the VP of sales, and he's like, yes, let's go do it. And you guys know the drill. Months later, we're still nowhere. Okay, you want to go fast? When we look at data, the, the companies that get to ROI faster, they take the simple walk across the hall to the SDR team and say, you're outbounding to a set of target accounts, I can help you. Then you work together. I'm just going to give you some simple things. You want to know context on when you use ads, marketing air cover. Start that in advance. Run that against everything you got. You got a bunch of vendors in here that do that, wink, wink. Okay. But that is what ch game changes here. Pre-SDR campaign, two days to two weeks before the SDRs go out. The numbers will increase from connect rates, which by the way, in any of you who manage SDR teams, that's the hardest thing there is against target accounts, and meeting set in your target account pipeline, and high fives. You want high fives? Go run pre-SDR campaigns and marketing air cover campaigns. They will come into your office and say, I just connected with this person, and they said they just, they, or they'll say, ah, gosh, why do I know you guys? Or they'll say, oh my God, I just saw you guys. Or thank you for that amazing direct mail. It's old school. Any of you guys who have gray hair like me, that's how ADRs and SDRs, that's how we used to do this. We'd follow up on marketing campaigns. Guess what? We were right. It's much easier. Try yourself. Go send someone something really nice and then call them. Uh, hi, you know, like that may or may not work better versus cold calling and saying, hi, we're the dot, 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 dot. By the way, we'll be in town uh, next week, Tuesday at 9 a.m. Would you be available for 10 minutes of coffee? I mean, come on. What's better than, hey, you know, we just sent you that thing, that, that really nice whatever it is, right? And we offered to talk to you about the use cases in your space, and we'd love to follow up on that and see what you go do, see what we can go do, uh, see what you can learn from us. That changes. It just does. It's intuitive, too, and the numbers back it up. All right, so this was, a, this was that going back to the actual campaign. So they had personalized pre-SDR campaigns, uh, delivering real air cover, customized air cover, name of the company in here. Uh, actual high value offer instead of just, hey, you know, come download a white paper. The offer was about them. It told the, the person looking that I'm about to give you an offer that will teach you something about yourself. And guess what? They, they didn't lie. The offer was about the company they're going after. And the game changed for the SDRs. They, I mean, we just put open rates up here, but look at the number of SQL. So that was a company that had 30 meetings and then said, oh, well, you can only call these people. And then the meetings all went down the tubes. Now they came back up again because we went to market together. It's actually the most, and it's fun. This is where you can have some fun. I mean, look at this. This looks, well, I mean, it, it looks fun. You got names of the company in there. You're giving them something really valuable. To, I mean, it makes total sense. And by the way, the SDRs, when they reach out, instead of offering the coffee or to do a demo, they're going to say, hey, you know, we'd love to talk to you about your in-store execution. That's high value, high conversion. So the other, the other thing we've seen is where we go in and a company says, well, I love this, but I'm, I've got a lot you know, happening right now. I can't change everything. You know, what should we go do? So you know, for those of you who have big demand gen machines, I'll tell you right now, tip number one, don't, don't turn it off, right? And I mean, it, it, I, it, I just had some really bad, I'm crying, I had some really bad stories about friends who tried to do that. They did. I mean, they, they went out there, they said, well, you know, this is wrong, we're going to right turn the Titanic, and boy, was it the Titanic, it was the worst thing they could have done. It said, let's just take certain areas and let's go modify them. So in this case, CRO said, you know, this, we are a target account focused organization, marketing can't switch everything. So what did they do? They just focused on one area, they focused on live events. So they did a lot of them, field marketing events. They weren't producing a lot of um, value. They were making sales feel really good. They just weren't producing a lot of value. So there's a perfect place to start. By the way, if you do your events right, like this, you're going to invite and get the right types of accounts here. And so what they did was they just took those. They, made, they put a different metric on it. Instead of just people in the seats, they put target accounts in the seats, 60% plus. 
They've used the target account proximity to figure out where they were gonna do it, and then they went to market together. You can see this, marketing, SDR, execs, direct mail, ads, right? And then they went to market together. And that was their game change. It was perfect. They were investing so much in it, and they just wanted to do better. So if you think about what they did here, they increased pipeline with 20% fewer leads. They got 30% growth overall with uh, target account, you know, these field events being their key to that success. All right, last one, expansion. Uh, ideal customer profile is not, does not have to be your hardest accounts. That's really important here, marketers, because oftentimes you guys get yourself in a hole because we go in there and we go account based. It's the way we can do it. And they're like, great, here are the, all the accounts I can't get into, and they're the hardest ones. Instead of saying, well, actually, why don't we start with, a, with uh, accounts that we know are valuable to us and actually close faster, et cetera. You want those? Upsell, cross-sell, expansion. Let's go into accounts that already have our product. Let's create a use case against it. And let's go use that as our way to be personalized and customized. So, you know, when we work, this is literally a real example where we went in, marketing was going to go to ABM. And sales had a $20,000 lifetime value in accounts that were huge. And they just didn't have any, it was too hard, it was a non-viral product. We were like, okay, here's what we're gonna do, come in the room. Marketing, you're doing account based? Yes. Sales, you'd like to expand these, this amazing customer list? Yes, okay, get together, go do it together. It was incredible, and it's been incredible. The vast, I mean, look, if you think about it, Everyone wants you to personalize. I want you to personalize. Sanger wants you to personalize. Everyone else here is going to want you to personalize, and it's hard. A lot of times it's a guess. How about we make it not a guess? We take the use case that we know about in a company, and that becomes the marketing plan. You're selling to AT&T. What are they most likely going to download? A, conver uh, a content conversation, et cetera, about what happened at AT&T. And it's there for you. It's there for the taking. It's really powerful and it changes things. We've seen uh, expansion only SDRs, expansion only demand gen folks that are just focused on that, and certainly expansion only account based programs. So, you know, the end of the day, I'll just tell you this. You know, I tell people the numbers on expansion, but it just makes total sense. I mean, I could tell you this all day, but like, come on. You go in, and you want to go land and expand. You have this asset that's at your fingertips. Here's what we did in Des Moines. I'd love to do it here in New York. Let's go talk about it. If you just change the SDR pitch, you'll win. If you, I mean, so why, why make it hard? You know, I just, I'll leave you with this on this expansion one. I tell you about the expansion SDRs where they literally, they meet, they figure out the use case, then they go and they spread in the accounts. And they were sending like five to 10 meetings in these big accounts over the course of you know, three weeks, and they were all great, because they got to talk about what they did at the other parts of the company, and they converted at a much higher rate than any of the sort of brute force net new did. So the last thing I'll leave you guys with is a thank you offer. I have uh, been warned, thank you person who was warning me. Who was that, you? Good job. By the way, most people are so worried I won't finish on time, I'll start, and it's like 30 minutes, and they'll warn me that it's 30 minutes left. So anyway, I made it this time, but anyway, if anybody wants the account-based funnel, just so you guys know, sales did have sales at Topo HQ on there. I changed it. Don't worry. You can go to the analyst team. We'll give it to you. But you may get a call and a 12-point cadence. No, I'm just kidding. Now you'll all be fine. And just say, send me the account-based funnel or anything else you want from these slides. I just want to thank you guys for today. I'm going to be here the rest of the day. I don't know if that matters to any of you, but if so, we can talk account-based the rest of the day, all right? Thanks a lot, everyone. Craig, thank you. Sangram, thank you. Eric, thank you. Anthony, you forgot to mention hashtag iHeartABM at the beginning. I asked you to. It's OK. Please feel free to social media this. It's really exciting. So happy you're all here to join us. But we are going to take a brief break. Please rejoin us again in about 10 minutes, 3.30. We have an action-packed second half. You are released for now. Yeah. Are we supposed to make up yet? Or uh, the person will come and tell us.
All right, we are going to get started here in just a moment. All right, welcome back to the second half. Uh, for those of you who are coming in uh, at the tail end of the uh, beginning presentations, my name is Eric Spett. I am the CEO and one of the co-founders of Terminus. Thank you again for being with us here. I uh, hope that the first few speakers were great. Uh, just heating up, we got a lot more goodness on the way. But before we dive in and I introduce our next speaker, um, we have a tradition at Terminus, which has never backfired, but this is definitely the largest audience we're gonna try it with. And before every all hands, before a lot of our internal meetings, even before our board meetings, we get stand up and we do a minute of hugs and high fives in the room. But, but today is a little different. And some of you might not have been here at the beginning, but Wednesday is Liz's birthday. And Liz has put a tremendous amount of work into making this event possible for all of us and is our wonderful partnership manager at LinkedIn. So rather than doing hugs and high fives to warm it up, let's all stand up and sing Liz happy birthday. Everybody ready? One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Liz. Happy birthday to you. There we go. All right, now give everybody one high five quickly, whoever's next to you. All right. All right, so our first speaker of the second half is Terminus's Chief Product Officer, Brian Brown. And while Brian is a product professional um, by title and background, Brian is actually one of the best marketers that any of us have ever met. And so Brian's got a very, very long history in B2B mar marketing technology. So uh, in the early 2000s, Brian co-founded a company called Vtrends, which some of you may have heard of if you look at the original Juniper Research Marketing Automation marketing graph. VTrends was this gigantic sun in the top right, while Marketo and Eloqua and Pardot were little specks in the middle. And now uh, VTrends was based in Fargo, North Dakota, and didn't take on uh, lots of venture funding, so the landscape changed. Uh, but Brian did have a very successful exit to Silverpop, where he led product strategy through their acquisition to IBM, where he went on to lead product strategy for all of IBM's marketing technology um, investments and acquisitions. And so we're very lucky to have Brian here today with us. He's going to tell all about our integration, Terminus's integration with LinkedIn, which will be available in the coming weeks. So let's give it up for Brian Brown. All right. How's everyone doing? Cool. You guys sounded great. You guys can sing well. Hopefully you market as good as you sing. Well, I'm excited to chat with you guys today. Um, let's go over here. OK, so I think there's one thing we all have in common, which is we have way too many things that we're doing. And uh, you know, I don't know, we did some research, and we found that the typical B2B marketing department was managing between 30 and 100 tools. You're like, that's impossible. But if you go back to your organization and you start adding up all the things that you've bought or used in some sort of random use case, you'll find that you have a huge number. And the challenge we have when we think about trying to engage target accounts is we need those tools to work better together. And that was really the inspiration behind Terminus wanting to partner with LinkedIn and allow marketers to, do, to take an ABM platform and apply it to the powerful way to reach their target accounts in LinkedIn. And so today, my job is to kind of show off what we built uh, and obviously pique your interest. Um, we'd love to, you know, after, come find me. I can walk you through a live demo. OK, so what is Terminus Plus LinkedIn? Well, when you step back and think about it, who actually, who in here has, has their team themselves or your team or your company is doing sponsored content or other advertising on LinkedIn? Raise your hand. All right, so yeah, if you're not raised your hand, come on, you know? This is a great way to engage your target accounts. So the challenge, though, 
is that you need data from other systems to allow you to better target accounts in LinkedIn. And you know, at Terminus, we have this passion and a mission to make B2B marketers heroes in their organizations. When we come in every day, that's what we're, that's what we're working to do. We, we want to take out the difficulty of technology and make it much, much easier for you to get your job done. And so we, we looked at this problem, and, you know, hundreds of our customers were coming to us saying, hey, I love Terminus, but I also love LinkedIn. Can you make it easier? Can you, can you bring these two things together? So the number one benefit is automating your target accounts to flow in and out of LinkedIn sponsored content campaigns. So as an account moves across the buyer's journey, imagine the sponsored content following that journey, dynamically, automatically, right? So that's probably benefit number one. The other one that, that companies love, and if you're doing target account engagement, you really wanna know which accounts are engaged. And so what we're doing with this integration is we're now making it so you can see exactly which accounts engaged with the ad and then went to your website and consumed additional content. So there's many other things I'll walk through and show you, but those are two of the big highlights. So we're gonna do a, a screen demo here. So who's used Terminus? Awesome, great. So you know uh, in Terminus, marketers can go in, they can bring in target accounts, they can create digital ads, and they can target specific personas or buying teams in that account and target and put those ads in front of those people across display advertising. So basically following people all over the web with these ads, you know, getting in front of their personas. And um, LinkedIn is a beautiful channel to create a really rich way to engage accounts. And so we wanted to combine those two. So now inside of Terminus, you can do display on web, you can do HTML5 ads, you can do video ads, and you can now do sponsored content. So let's go ahead and we'll pick the LinkedIn option. So the next thing we have to do is we say, well, what accounts do we want to actually bring in to LinkedIn for our campaign? And so if you're going to do some sort of sponsored content campaign to a group of accounts, the question is, where will you get those accounts from? Now, most of us in marketing are used to like the painful process of going and grabbing some list of accounts from some system and manually bringing them to another system. And so that's, that is an option on here, but we wanted to make it a lot easier than that. So you can dynamically grab accounts from your CRM system. You can dynamically grab accounts from an MA system. You can dynamically grab accounts from a, a partner of ours, EverString. So if anyone's using like a predictive tool. So we launched an API that allows data vendors that you guys probably use, like a Discover Org or DataFox, to program against our API to make it so that those options are available to you. And we're building out the, that list of companies. And so here are, here are some of the ones that are available today. You also might be using Playmaker in Engageo. Imagine having a play where as the reps are outreach, doing outreach to target accounts, it's triggering simultaneous advertising to back up what the, what the SDR is trying to do with that account, right? So orchestrating is very important to us. We wanna make it much easier for you to manage these accounts and their experience across multiple channels. All right, so we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna select Salesforce, and so now you can watch the little demo up here. But essentially, in Terminus, you're able to select an object in Salesforce that has the account you're trying to get at, so we're gonna go ahead and pick the opportunity object. And from within the opportunity object, I can say like, well, who am I looking for? Well, let's, in this scenario, let's say, basically when an op is created at a target account, I wanna bring them in automatically to this LinkedIn sponsored content campaign. And so it's gonna show you the list, and automatically, every day, it's gonna pick new accounts that match this rule. So now your LinkedIn sponsored content is changing every day, new accounts are flowing in. So the question is, how do you take an account out, right? When is advertising enough? When is that sponsored content you know, made the impact you needed on that account? So the next step is that you can step, step back and say, okay, what, what does progression look like? When will we know that that sponsored content played its role and we can move forward? So by tapping into key buying signals like stage progression in an opportunity or like something like engagement, 
we can say, okay, once the opportunity reaches a certain stage, we're going to change the content that they see uh, in LinkedIn. So you could literally create a different ad experience on LinkedIn for every stage of the buying cycle, right? And you don't have to wait for opportunity. You could do it at MQL or MQA, right? So you could start back at the beginning. You could also do it to generate awareness or to start you know, advertising to net new accounts. Okay, now LinkedIn has an incredible rich set of B2B data. It is arguably the best, you know, the purest form because it's like everyone, you know, it's, it's you know, people have to put in their own data, right? And they, they don't fake it because you know, it's not like filling out a form where you make up a bunch of stuff just so you can get the white paper. It's like legit, it's you, it's, you. it's gotta be you or it doesn't make sense. So we tap into that data so you can get location, job title. So imagine being able to target this sponsored content from accounts that are in your CRM system all the way through to LinkedIn and the actual personas that matter, right? So if you wanna reach the HR department or IT or senior decision makers, right? All that's available through display or now through LinkedIn. Okay, so then it comes down to how much you're gonna spend. So you enter in your budget. Now LinkedIn is really good at giving us marketers an estimated bid amount. So if you've used LinkedIn sponsored content before, you know there's a, a part where you get to this page and it says you should bid you know, $4.62. And that number is based on all the factors, the, the accounts you put in, where you're targeting, who you're targeting. And so because Terminus built this dynamic integration, as you add accounts, as they flow in and out from your CRM system, we will check the bid estimate from LinkedIn and automatically set you at the appropriate bid. So it's a really easy way to, you know, really in a powerful way, reach your target accounts. Now this is the fun part. We are marketers after all. We do like things that are creative and look pretty. So this is the sponsored content itself. Um, this is the builder in Terminus where you actually build the sponsored content. And this will show up in LinkedIn as promoted content in someone's feed. So you can see the little uh, um, sponsored content preview here. You click submit. And then we all like success. So hooray, you've created your, your campaign in Terminus. Um, behind the scenes, what's happening is we are syncing your accounts to LinkedIn. We're automating the matching process. So if you've gone through this process before, you know that it can take several days before you know how many of your accounts matched to a LinkedIn uh, company page. So we're actually doing that in real time behind the scenes. So you'll know in pretty instantly uh, how many you've matched and whether your campaign is ready to be launched. Once it goes live and the metrics start coming in, at the top here we've got you know, basically all of the campaign details. So everything that you just set up. The next section here are the metrics that you would traditionally see in LinkedIn. Now the part that we're most excited about is the ability to see actually which companies are engaged. So all the companies that target accounts that you've brought over into this campaign on LinkedIn now show up in here and you can see which ones matched a LinkedIn uh, company page and which ones didn't. And then you'll see which ones have engaged with the content and gone through to your website. What do you think? Yeah? All right. So. As a marketer, it's important, you know, we've heard all about engagement, right? And we know that one of the best things we could provide to sales teams is which accounts are engaged, right? Imagine if once a week you could provide your sales team with their, their, of their target accounts, the ones that are most engaged that week. That would be pretty awesome. And so in addition to just saying, did they engage with a piece of content, while that's important to marketers, the sales team wants to know, Overall, how engaged is this account and how many people are engaged? And that's what this report is for. Um, all of this data is rolled up to accounts. So we hook into your website, we convert anonymous traffic into company traffic, and then we map that back to all your campaigns. So from a marketing perspective, you know which campaigns are driving companies' target accounts to engage. From a sales perspective, sales can now see which accounts are surging on your brand or on specific product content. 
So here's just a, a highlight. Now in this example, you can see a bunch of companies on the left, and you can also see which ones were engaged with display, which ones were engaged with LinkedIn content, and which ones were engaged with both. But again, even if someone doesn't consume content and they just come directly to the website, like you're doing other forms of outreach, you know, you do events, people just go to your website, that's gonna get picked up and rolled up into an account view as well. So sales teams have the full experience of, of an account, like how many people are actually engaged with us from that account. All right, so just to wrap it up here, if you could, if you could literally put an advertisement in front of people at your target account along the buyer's journey, you would have a much better ability to impact and influence the people in that account. And at different stages of the buying cycle, there's different people who are gonna to respond to different content. And so one of the you know, things that most of our customers who use LinkedIn today tell us is they're using it to drive awareness. It's demand gen, right? They want to put this sponsored content out there to wake up accounts that they've never engaged with, and then they'll follow up with which ones engage. And that's just really like the very beginning of what's possible. So this example here, what I wanted to just highlight was you have, you know, you could have that net new campaign, a sponsored content campaign, but as that account moves through your CRM process, as they become qualified, as you open up an opportunity, through Terminus, you could change that advertising experience and engage them and the right people differently across this. So we'll just jump in here to imagine, you know, it's an early sales sort of experience. So like SDR qualifies the account, sets up a demo, the AE gets involved. Now suddenly the content on LinkedIn has changed and it represents the backing up of that AE. So the, the AE is starting to engage the account and now the content realizes that this person is an early, uh, in an early sales stage. And so they're gonna enter into the campaign. They're gonna see advertising. That advertising can be orchestrated across the web through display, as well as in LinkedIn sponsored content. Terminus is collecting all that data. Uh, you may have recently heard we acquired a company called BrightFunnel. BrightFunnel is a marketing analytics platform. It's an incredible platform for marketers to see you know, what is happening with an account all the way through the funnel. And so that data is coming into Terminus. It's gonna come into BrightFunnel. And then you can use that to alert sales on their, on their engaged accounts. And then once that account moves to the next buying cycle, it progresses out of the campaign and moves to the next campaign and so on. So this is just a incredibly powerful way to engage your accounts with advertising in a way where you can really automate it through that buyer's journey. And if I, you know, you think back to that first slide with all the sticky notes, right? Your desk probably looks much more organized than that, but mine sort of is chaotic, right? There's just like notes everywhere. And right, what we wanted to do really is, is just make it easier, right? We know it's really powerful to do sponsored content. We know that it works. We know from our customers that it really does drive a lot of engagement. The question is how could we help you do a lot more? And that's really what we set out to do. So uh, happy to take questions later. Um, and again, thank you so much for, uh, for, you know, it's an incredible event, tons of energy. Um, all the speakers so far have been awesome. So next up, we have uh, Lars from Snowflake. And uh, Snowflake is a Terminus customer. Lars is VP of Marketing and Demand Gen there. And the thing that I really, uh, you know, getting to know Lars a little bit. Um, this is his second company where he is officially brought in and, and worked on an ABM initiative. But in his career, he's always been focused on aligning sales and marketing. So Lars, come on up. Thank you. So, uh, Lars Christensen from Snowflake Computing. Um, we have five key functions that are rolling up to our demand generation department, and that's marketing operations. It's broad-based demand generation, which is still very much alive and kicking. We have field marketing, we have industry marketing, and then we have ABM that kind of goes across those departments. In addition, of course, they have standalone deliverables. 
Three things about myself, born in Denmark, so this accent you have to struggle through for the next 18 minutes is a Danish accent. Secondly, I'm passionate about automation. It just so happens that all the different companies that I've gravitated to, all the roles that I've had in the past, they've really all been about either formalizing a demand generation approach or scaling a demand generation approach. So I've always found it useful to bring in technologies that can help with the scaling and also help creating these processes that are being, that are being created, make sure that they're turned into repeatable processes and make sure that you embed a certain level of consistency in your execution. I think technology is great for that. And then thirdly, I'm a snowflake, and that's something I became about 18 months ago. Uh, it was when I joined uh, Snowflake Computing down in San Mateo. I was employee number 110 that joined the company. Right now, we're about 365 people, and we hope to double that amount this calendar year. So it's an exploding company when it comes to the size of the company, and the sales and marketing team in particular is exploding. And that was one of the things that led us towards ABM because sales was sitting, we had a sales team that was aligned by zip codes and area codes and some complicated uh, overlay of those two, including some verticals. But it was really hard to rapidly infuse a lot of new reps into the territories with that approach because we constantly had to move people's markets around. So we decided to align the sales team by named accounts. So as the sales teams are aligning in one direction, so does marketing have to do that. And I was lucky enough that I came from a company where I just rolled out an ABM uh, approach uh, to support sales. So it was uh, a little bit of a head start that I had when we got started here with uh, Snowflake. The agenda, roughly our definition of ABM, our tech stack, just the three key um, horsemen in our, in our execution, account selection, engagement, prioritization, and then there's a few examples here towards the end. ABM at Snowflake, so we currently have two people focused on ABM, so that's really the size of the team. Of course, they get support from uh, marketing operations and everyone else in the organization, but we have two people that's in charge of it. We have 3,000 accounts that currently represents our target for the ABM effort out there. And we have 200 accounts where we are designing message-specific one-to-one -one campaigns. So before we dive into that, just, just want to give you a quick uh, snapshot of our stack reporting, data engagement. You know most of all these vendors out there. I just want to highlight one thing. We are a cloud data warehousing company which allows us to consume our own technologies. I know having a data warehouse is something that's relatively new in marketing. It's very, very helpful. If you look across the marketing team, we have probably 25 technologies. Those are rotating in and out, all depending on whether they're adding value or not. It's so easy to bolt on and add new technologies, but they will leave you at some point. So a data warehouse gives you kind of free things. It gives you an opportunity to to really report across all the different technology silos that you have. Secondly, it gives you an opportunity to time travel within your data, so you can go back and you can see, well, what did our data look like 90 days ago when we entered into the quarter? And thirdly, the data becomes your own. So when the technology leaves you, the data stays with you. And that's hugely important. The learnings that you paid good money for will stay with you as a company. So that's kind of one technology that I wanted to highlight. All right, our process. First, it's about account selection. Craig talked a little bit about ideal customer profiles. It's something that we have used a lot also. We have about 25,000 accounts sitting in our Salesforce system. Those have all gone through some ideal customer profile mapping first. Out of those, 
the sales team have selected, they can go out, each of them can select about 60 account that now becomes their territory. In those 60 accounts, we have 50 reps roughly, so that's 3,000 accounts that becomes named accounts in our system. And those are the ones that becomes the target for ABM. A subset of those 3,000 can be classified as priority accounts. So those are the ones where we go in, we elevate the spending, we venture into slightly more expensive marketing vehicles, sales are elevating their effort in those accounts. So those are the ones that we're doing one-to-one -one marketing with. Now, a key driver for our selection of these accounts is some of the data that we're getting out of a system called Engageo. Quickly, for those who doesn't know, Engageo is a system that maps your leads in Salesforce to the accounts you have in Salesforce. The, your contacts are already mapped to the account, so that's not a problem. Furthermore, you have mapped all your interesting moments in your Marketo system, and you have assigned different points to those interesting moments. So now you can track what all the leads that are aligning to your accounts, all the contacts that are aligning to your accounts. You, you, can, you can now create an engagement score based on what these people have done. So an example, if a prospect is coming to our website, we'll give them two points of engagement for browsing our website, and additional two points if they go to some of the high value ad pages. If they download a white paper, we'll give them 10 minutes. If they attend a webcast, we'll give them 15 minutes. If they show up for one of our physical events, we'll give them 30 minutes, so on and so forth. So this allows us very easily to figure out what is the engagement level in an account. All the interesting moment times what all the leads that are aligned to the account times all the contacts that are aligning to the ac account plus some reverse IP technology that we have out on the website. So what we are doing every time a new AE comes and joins the company is that we sit down and we look at the unassigned 25,000 accounts and we are saying which accounts in your geographical area are currently looking at us. Who are the most engaged accounts and why don't we define your market, your territory that you're gonna make money off? Why don't we define that by the accounts that are already lukewarm? They're already coming to our website. They're already attending our events. They're downloading our content. So this makes the Engagement with sales, very meaningful. It's something that Daniel is doing every time we have onboarding in our headquarter. We'll go out and we will have that conversation with them. Furthermore, we can go in through some normalization of the title in Engageo and we can see where is our engagement in those accounts. Is it on the C level? Is it on the director level? Is it on the manager level? Do we have engagement across all the key personas that truly matters for us? So those are some of the signals that we sit and we go through and we identify the key, most likely accounts to engage for those reps. EverString is a new technology that we have just launched uh, a few months ago. So in addition to that, the engagement data we are getting from Engageo, we have gone in and we have done some model exercises with EverString and we have found all the 25,000 accounts we have, which one fits a model, which one will become an ideal deal size for us, which one will travel fast through the opportunity cycle. And furthermore, through EverString, we have Bombora data piped in, so we can look and not only look at the engagement that happens within our marketing universe, but what are these accounts looking at outside the scope of our marketing universe? What are they searching for? Which sites are they hitting? And based on that, we can create a narrative and we can create a theme and say, is this an account that we should talk to? Is, their search is the search history of that account such that it's an interesting point for us to start a conversation? All right, engagement, hugely important. So when an account in Salesforce is marked as a named account, it starts an investment cycle on the marketing side. First of all, we go in and we have a look, 
do we have coverage in the account? We don't want sales to focus on, on trolling through LinkedIn and data.com to find and populate contacts into the account. We take that on. So the minute we can see it's a top 100 account, it starts an investment strategy in contact discovery that we are executing on, on the marketing side. Furthermore, we're starting some inbound strategies. Of course, there's the terminus, because we all know that just because you start emailing new people you have added to your database, it doesn't mean they're gonna start responding. So you need to warm them up. You need to put your um, brand name, you need to put, put your message in front of them. And we're using Terminus, we're using LinkedIn to do that. When we have their attention, it's very important that you're putting the right content in front of them. So that's where we have adopted a technology called Uberflip. It allows us in mass quantity to generate resource pages. So we have about 250 different resource pages. So depending on the customer's level of engagement, depending on their intent, depending on their um, technology stack that we can find through discover.org, we will put different content in front of them. This is a very easy system to make sure that once you have their attention, you wanna deepen the engagement as much as possible. Furthermore, and this was some of the stuff that Craig talked about, very often it comes down to old school SDIing and we are giving our SDRs some great tools. Uh, we are giving them Vidyard, which is a tool where they can create uh, an account-based or a persona-based video that they can record, embed into the email and send it out. We have PFL, which is a great tool from within salesforce.com, the SDR team can send out three dimensional direct mailers. And we have VLG, which is another direct mail shop that we're using to heighten the engagement. If you make an effort, you're, you will hear something back. We're getting a significant higher response rate from all these things. All right, so this was a little bit what Brian talked about, the buyer's journey. So we can look at our accounts, we're looking at the engagement level, we're largely getting from Engageo, and we can go in and we can see if they're unaware, we have a dummies guide we can put in front of them. That's very light lifting content. If they're engaged, we wanna drive them to our weekly live demo that we have. And if they're highly engaged, so those are when we have multiple people across multiple departments that are mass consuming our content, I think we earned the right to invite them to try our product out. So this is where we're pushing them to the free trial. So this is using some of the data that we have from Engageo on the engagement side. We're also starting to use intent as targeting. And we have three different themes. We have multiple topics under each theme, but we have data warehouse modern, modernization, we have BI acceleration, and Hadoop alternatives. Those are some of the themes that we are currently tracking. So when we see that the account is having a search within those themes, we activate different sales plays. So there's a whole library that sales will have with proof points, content, and so on and so forth, script for the SDR teams that feeds into the notion that these people are currently looking at doing some kind of BI acceleration or Hadoop alternatives. But something that speaks to the narrative that we know is already alive and well within the account. All right, alignment with the SDR team or BDR team, it was something that Craig also talked about. It is hugely important. We have divided our SDR team between inbound and outbound. And of course the outbound team that's the team, their task is to maximize the number of meetings generated in the named account base. Through the Engageo technology, we can match all incoming leads with accounts. Thus, we can route all those interesting moments to the BDR that's covering the AE that owns that account. 
So very easy. We are not just just round robbing all these uh, interesting moments that comes in, but we're giving it to people who actually knows things about this specific account. Furthermore, of course, they can go in using Engageo and Salesforce and they can see in the patch that they are covering what are some of the most engaged accounts today, this week, this month, and so on and so forth. The field sales team, a hugely important engagement point also. It's the account selection process where we work with them. And of course, we are constantly invited to the, this is one of the other interesting things that happens. Suddenly when you're doing these type of things, when you're doing things in accounts that sales really care about, they'll start inviting you to their, to their sales meetings, which is very enlightening. So that is where we really go over the territory with them. We give them some sense for where the engagement is. And of course, we're also sending off email notification when an account is moving into what we would call a marketing qualified account. It's not a marketing qualified leads, but a marketing qualified account instead. So we're doing all this, we're using engagement data, we're using how many people are engaged to qualify MQA, but we still feel like there was something missing. And this is something that we're gonna roll out this quarter. We have 15 other data points that we want to bake into this concept of a marketing qualified account. We'll be getting a lot of that from our relationship with Bombora and with EverString. So in addition to whether they are engaged, we'll go, do they fit the deal size model? Is this a deal that's gonna move through the funnel relatively fast? Is this an account that's currently looking at related things on other websites? Is it the right company size? Is it a company with the right tech stack? And so on and so forth. All right, I'm down to my last minute, I think. Just wanna share this example with you. So this is, of course, a, a, um, a Terminus ad. And one thing that's really interesting when you are using a company's name, two things can happen. They'll either click on it or they'll freak out. Uh, we have had very few, I think we've only had one example of people that would uh, freak out. But normally, I've been around display ads for a long time, and you will typically have a 0.09% click-through rate on these. Um, when we're dealing with, with highly account-based, we can get upwards of 2 to 3% click-through rates on that. And you all know what these, these ads are costing. It's really not a lot of money per thousand, so it's a tremendous amount of engagement that you can get. Right behind here, you will see the... Um, the Uberflip resource page that we put together. And this is also very interesting. You can barely see this, but we know through our relationship with Discover.org that they're using Tableau as their front-end BI tool. So naturally, we are populating this resource page with a data sheet that tells how we work with Tableau. We know it's a very engaged account at this point, so naturally, we're trying to push them towards our free trial. If it wasn't, then we would have put in another offer there. We know through our relationship with Bombora exactly what they are searching for, and we know their level of interest out there. So we found a customer success story that should resonate well with how they're thinking about data warehousing. So that's why we're using data to populate these resource centers so we can maximize the engagement when a customer is finally hitting it. All right, we're doing a lot of these different things all the time, free dimensional mailer. Largely, I just wanna share with you how we're measuring ABM. This is not a good slide, but there's a lot inner beauty in it that I'm sure you will appreciate, but this is just a sample from uh, the Eastern region where we are tracking 1,635 accounts, and you can see Leading up to the end of Q2, or when, when we finished Q, Q, Q2, you can kind of see here we had 328 uh, non-engaged accounts or unaware accounts, accounts that hadn't done anything with us. Uh, and then we had 731 aware accounts. That means that they have opened our emails, they have been to our website. And then we had 347 
engaged account. So they've actually consumed some of our content. And then we had 169 highly engaged accounts. So that's where we have engaged, we have engagement across multiple departments. And you can see how we are tracking. So at the end of Q3, just looking back on the last 90 days, we performed a whole lot better. There's now you know, 220 highly engaged accounts and 435 engaged accounts and so on and so forth. So we need to put together some frameworks for measuring this. And uh, this is something that we are still experimenting with. But you know, just like it was the case when we did the old waterfall, there has to be some service level agreements with the individual regions that you're servicing in terms of how many of the accounts you care about should we really generate awareness in, engagement in, high engagement in, and so on and so forth. And uh, that's something that we are admittedly still working on, but I think it clarifies what you do, it clarifies how you add value. So with that said, thank you so much for your time. I'm hoping for a rousing edition of she For She's a Jolly Good Fellow now, if that's okay. No, that was mortifying, but thank you, Eric, for and all of you for those birthday wishes. Um, I am here to introduce our final session of the day, which is so exciting, but also so sad because this has been so wonderful. This is our account-based marketing pioneer panel. And we have a couple illustrious marketers coming up to the stage. First, I'd like to welcome our moderator, Justin Schreiber, who's the Vice President of Marketing for LinkedIn Sales and Marketing Solutions. Welcome. Next, we have Ty Heath. She is the Agency and Partner Education Lead here at LinkedIn. Matt Amundsen, the VP of Marketing and Sales Development at EverString. Welcome, Matt. And last but not least, Rob Israt, the, the CMO at Tipalti. Well, it's great to be here, and we get to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is account-based marketing. But I figured that just to set the tone, we needed to set the bar very low so that we could exceed it. <laughs> So my question to start off is, I want to know the worst marketing campaign that you have been subjected to. And we'll build from there. How does that sound? So Rob, maybe we start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, so I've received some marketing where basically the personalized message was, we sell to e-commerce companies like you. Unfortunately, Topalti is a B2B tech company. So they basically just communicated, we're not for you. And you know, get a lot of sales prospecting, so you eliminate the company really early based on a poor communication like that, particularly if you're selling sales and marketing technology. Yeah, that's problematic. All right, Matt, can you beat that? I think I can. I get a <laughs> lot of crap. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. We could go on for <laughs> yeah, days I could, yeah. Limitless. <laughs> with this topic. Let's get it started. Uh, yeah, so for a long time, my LinkedIn profile said, I'll take meetings for cupcakes. Mm. And so I got a lot of cupcakes, which are not bad. <laughs> the shocking thing is how few people actually put their name on them. Like, they, I just get cupcakes. Random boxes I, of cupcakes. I tweet it out, and I'm like, hey, whoever sent these, yes, I'll take a meeting. Which explains why you started a business on the side for a while of selling cupcakes. Yeah, secondhand cupcakes. It was a big deal. And like, a little side hustle <laughs> thing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> but the worst thing that I ever saw is actually there's a company that was sending pizza boxes. And I mean, Take a look at me, right? Like, I got excited. And what was inside was like an eight and a half by 11 glossy of what their company did. Like, no pizza. Like, horrible bait and switch. Please don't do that. All right, Ty. OK, so I'm going to be nice, because I, okay. nice, I, I get a lot of You're going to bring that elevated Yeah, I'm going to elevate it a little bit, because I get a lot of bad marketing, but it's just not memorable. I'm just like, delete, like, get rid of it, put it in spam. Mm -hmm. Uh, but most memorable for me was actually from, and I'll, I'll give this agency a shout out if they're listening or if they get this, Square 2 Marketing. Oh, yeah. Uh, solid, Carrie Betts. 
solid uh, HubSpot Diamond Level Partner Award winning, uh, sent a gift Probably. box. I opened the box. Inside the box is a jar of marshmallow fluff. So get in the, hold on a second. So everyone knows what that is, right? You make fluff another sandwiches with this. And then inside of that was a card that said, this is the last fluff you'll ever get from us. Oh, so I thought that was pretty cool. It was an invitation to partner and connect, and I will never forget that. So shout All out right. to Mike Lieberman and Square, too. Any, any fluff or nutter fans in the house? <laughs> Just raise your hand here. Yeah, we got a few. OK. I'm going to take it back down, because we don't want to get we don't want to creep up too quickly here. <laughs> okay. This right. actually happened to my brother, who's an entrepreneur. And he needed some telesales software. And he was constantly being bombarded, one particular company, with campaigns that were, were talking about these mega accounts that they had closed, case studies, whatnot. And of course, he's a startup, so this means nothing to him. They finally get him hooked, though, because they offer a free trial. He calls up, and he says, I'm, I want to talk to you about the free trial. And literally, he said, I heard them cover up the phone. They didn't even put me on mute. And they go, does anybody know about a free trial that we're running right now? Oh, no. And there's like this, this background noise. And then they come back, and, and the guy's thoroughly perplexed. And he goes, ah, uh, I don't know about the free trial, but I can do an amazing deal for you if you're ready to deal today. So uh, of course, my brother did not buy. What ended up happening, though, is this became the story that he told at all of the, the parties that he went to with all of the other entrepreneurs in Seattle. And so not only did he have a bad experience, but then all the entrepreneurs got to find out about his bad experience. And so it spread like wildfire. And what was initially one bad experience became you know, snowballed over time, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting because we live in a day and age where you can't isolate those bad experiences anymore. If you miss the mark then it's out for everyone to hear. Uh, case in point is the unfortunate exchange uh, with Travis at Uber. And uh, maybe he was having a bad day, maybe not. But unfortunately, the whole world knows about uh, our errors and our mistakes. You back that up by the fact that my brother, this is turning into a stereotypical entrepreneur story, <laughs> had just bought a Tesla. And so this was the experience he had when he was buying his Tesla. He walks in. And they greet him at the door. Somehow they knew his name. That's a little creepy. But he personalized the car. They told him exactly when the car was going to be arriving. He got status on his phone. The car was delivered to his doorstep. And then if anything went wrong, they knew before he did. They came and picked it up and brought him a loaner. So the bar has been set at a completely different level. And the challenge is that if companies aren't at the level of the best experience you've had, then it doesn't matter, because that's the new expectation. So with that as a premise, we're going to talk about account-based marketing and how to do it right. Now, uh, we wanted to mix it up a little bit, and we knew this was the last session of the day. Pictures are always great. Pictures, as they say, are worth a 1,000 words. So we have challenged our <laughs> panelists here, very talented, to actually pick one picture that sums it all up what account-based marketing means to them. Are you guys ready? Yes. yes. All right, let's give this a shot. First of all, we're going with Ty. <laughs> Ty, what does this picture have to do with yes. ABM? Do yes. tell. Yes, I will. So uh, I'm guessing that given this audience, many of you have seen at least one episode of Mad Men, yes? Yes, Mad Men? Okay, so this is Peggy Olson. She is my favorite character from Mad Men. She's kind of an unsung heroine. She gets the job done, right? And a lot of things have changed since the days of marketing and advertising during Mad Men. We're not going back to those, those days. But one thing has not changed, and that's the importance of relationships. So whether it was Lucky Strike, Heinz, Campbell's Soup, the people of Mad Men were hyper-focused on the accounts that mattered to them. So they were very focused on building those relationships. They wined them, they dined them, they drank all the whiskey, they smoked all the cigars <laughs> together, and uh, it made a difference. And it's not just about knowing those accounts that you're involved with and building relationship with them. It's also about, as you've heard multiple times in this session, building relationship with your salespeople. So I think Mad Men is a really good reminder that it's important not to, not to just invest in expanding relationships, expanding the connections with those accounts digitally, but to do that in real life as well. 
So that's why I chose Mad Men. And also have to acknowledge Sangram, who has a really good blog post that cites Mad Men. I always now use this as a way to explain account-based marketing at a very basic level. It's about relationships and relationship expansion. Awesome. All right. Good one. To, we're taking the bar way up. You're always on. You're always taking it up. Thank always you. taking it to the next Thank level. You. Okay. Here we go, <laughs> Matt. Please, do tell. Um, all right, so if anybody else is like me, you stay up really late watching uh, strange late night television, like uh, Tim and Eric, awesome show, great job. Uh, and they have this sketch called The Universe, which is pretty famous. Uh, it's got like 10 million views on YouTube. And it's basically them pretending to be astrologers, talking about how the universe was formed and trying to explain the universe uh, in ways that have absolutely nothing to do with real science. It's actually... It's, it's hilarious, take my word for it. And to me, it feels a lot like ABM in its current format, where there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of people who talk about things the right way, but they don't actually know what they're talking about. But they just get up here, and they're very convincing, not unlike I am right now. <laughs> All right. We're going we're gonna to come back to that one. We're gonna, we, we need you to set us straight, Matt. But before we do that, Rob has got to tell us more Post-it notes. Going back to Brian, this is a good a good theme for us through the day, our post-it notes. Yeah, I get the word of the most boring visual, I think. But um, what I was kind of getting at, Craig talked a little earlier about ABM and strategy, and that you have to have a strategy before you go through your target account list and before you decide what programs, what measurements you have to have. And at the end of the day, when you get your CO and CRO aligned, where you're really aligning behind all this infrastructure and data process and the such, it's ultimately about personalizing, right? It kind of goes to what's been talked about. It's personalized by the company and then the people at the company. And so that's really what, you know, a well-executed ABM strategy ultimately should deliver almost a one-to-one -one personal experience by company, you know, within by company, by the different buying centers in the company. And so it really gets it back down to personalization. Um, if you have all the data, have all the targeting, all perfect, but the message is the same message for everyone, you've kind of only gotten 40% of your way there. So you have to really start and think of the whole process end to end. And it's not just marketing, right? Sales has to do it too. If you are being targeted by a company, you have one salesperson t selling one set of products, but that same company, another one selling either the same product or different, you, they basically just told you that they're in a competent company. You want to work with them. So that's a part of it. And so marketing and sales really have to align in this and make sure that you're delivering that same personalized focused discussion across that whole experience, marketing, sales, buying center, company, et cetera. So. Great. So good definition there of ABM. And Matt, I want to come back to you as well. You said there are a lot of different definitions for ABM and a lot of confusion. How would you define ABM then? What's the right way to think about it? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a holistic business approach where your company is targeting another account. And you're, you're targeting it holistically. I think a lot of people will target a company that's a great fit and then send a direct mail piece to the buyer and say, well, that's ABM. Uh, ABM is all about encircling the, the buying group, right? So that's, that's going low, it's going high, it's executive to executive outreach. And I think you know, when you're doing a great job of targeting accounts and understanding you know, things like CAC ratios and you know, what the lifetime value of an account can be, you can go that extra mile. You can have CEO to CEO outreach. So the way I define account-based marketing is it's a holistic approach to targeting a, an account holistically, both low, mid, and high. Yep, yep. I actually, I've been thinking about this definition as well. I have a problem with the acronym. I know we're at an ABM I think Love Fest because we have the uh, the logo. It's in the logo, but I personally have an issue with the term itself. So account-based marketing (ABM) two out of the three letters are a strikeout for me. So first of all, account. Um, you know, I, I had an opportunity to call upon General Electric. That's an account. But you think about the diversity of businesses that live under the umbrella that we know as General Electric. And I think, Rob, you put your finger on it. There are buying, buying centers. And ultimately, those buying centers make decisions about what to bring into an organization. If we're not focused on buying centers, even if we're focused at the account level, we're missing the mark. So to me, the atomic unit really is about the buying center and not the account. And then the second letter in the acronym that I have a problem with is marketing. Because you think about what happened to my brother 
maybe marketing was on, well, marketing was off the point because they weren't shooting in the right uh, campaigns. But even if they were, if it wasn't a joint sales and marketing effort, then again, there's a strikeout. So um, I think ultimately there needs to be a term that talks about buyer centers, that needs to talk about sales and marketing. And I think ABM is coming to represent that, but uh, maybe the term itself is a little bit behind the, the concept. Ty, I'd love your perspective on where, in your mind, ABM actually falls short. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've been talking a lot about marketing and how marketing should help. We've also been talking about sales. I think where marketing falls short is not necessarily thinking about how to bring in sales. We've been talking a lot about sales and marketing alignment. Account-based marketing is one side of the coin. Social selling is the other side of the coin. So for those of you who haven't heard about social selling, it is when you use social media insights to reach out to, to nurture, to build relationships, sharing helpful thought leadership and engaging with prospective buyers. Our job as a marketer is to provide sales, provide air cover, provide content to support them in closing the sale and bringing that relationship along. With social selling, you have an army of salespeople that's ready to help make that content available to the buying committee. So if you're not investing on the sales side as well and tapping into them with social selling, you're really only engaging one side of that formula. So you know, I think with Sales Navigator, for example, a LinkedIn product, that's how salespeople are going in and identifying accounts, identifying people in those accounts to engage with. And uh, one of the things that we're testing at LinkedIn is the capacity for you to, uh, as a salesperson, create saved account leads that a marketer can then go and target. And so it's closing that loop and it's enabling the collaboration that I think we've, we've talked about today but can't stress enough. It's only one side of the coin if you're not also looking at how can I advance my social selling. So hyper-personalization is a theme, a thread, that runs both through ABM and social selling. Mm -hmm. The notion that there's an individual on the other end, on the other end of that communication and you've got to tailor what you're doing to them. That's right. So let me follow up on that. Um, you know, you go back to the days of door-to-door -door selling. You had one person standing in front of one person, and there was immediately an opportunity to have a rapport. We can't do that anymore. And I think it's not just about personalization, but also being able to scale that That's right. at massive levels. Mm -hmm. How would you take those tactics or techniques that you were just describing, but apply them at large scale Mm -hmm. while still retaining the, the level of personalization that's required. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, there are some really great examples of companies who've done this well. And some of the insights that folks have shared today give you some sense of how to do that. A couple things uh, that I think lead to a strong uh, account-based marketing strategy along with sales involve, first, making sure that you are aligned, first and foremost, that you have agreement on what accounts am I going after, making sure that you have the stakeholder buy-in. I think also then content is incredibly important. So salespeople provide tremendous voice of customer information, right? So if you're talking with salespeople, if you're having stand-up meetings and aligning on the type of content, what are the customer problems, that's gonna inform your content. So you're taking salespeople along in that approach. Another thing to do is take the segmentation that a lot of people talked about today. So for example, a company that's done really well with account-based marketing at LinkedIn, Genesis, came in with 10,000 accounts and they, what they did is they had seven of those accounts focused on account-based marketing. They had 1,000 focus accounts and then maybe 9,000 or so saved accounts from the salespeople. So they had a tiered approach. Mm. They brought sales along with voice of customer to inform the content message. And then you wanna make sure that you're also testing and experimenting along the way. So they had weekly meetings where they went back and checked and they were constantly optimizing and constantly learning from salespeople. What are you hearing in the field? And with that, they're able to tweak the message. So I think looking at how you do that at scale involves some work on the ground, but then you have tools like the LinkedIn Terminus integration, you have Sales Navigator, you have uh, the, what we're piloting with the saved accounts that's starting to inform the automation and collaboration uh, with sales and marketing. 
I'm glad you I'm glad you shared that point about the pyramid shape of ABM. You have mm -hmm. you have three tiers, if you will. The highest tier has the smallest number of accounts in it. That's where you're ultra personalized and ultra focused, a mid tier and a, and a bottom tier. Mm -hmm. And so certainly the intent is not every single account gets the same That's level right. of, mm -hmm. of focus and attention. Um, right. But surely the top the top mm -hmm. level does. Absolutely. Great. So Rob, I want to come back to a point that you made about this notion of sales, marketing, working together. Number one, has that been a focus for you in your organization? And if so, what did you have to do to make that alignment happen? And when you did, what was the impact? Yeah, so uh, when I joined the company about three and a half years ago, we didn't have a, a target account approach. I prefer that to ABM, actually. Um, we didn't have that. So one of the things, the first things we did is, you know, I had like five strategic levers, two of the five. One was personalization, one was target accounts. By actually creating a target account list for sales, you know, using input from them and feedback from them, but then ultimately programmatizing it and getting their buy-in on that, that really helped align marketing and sales because it gives them trust that, wow, marketing is actually going to focus their efforts on the same companies we agreed to focus on. Uh, and then we built a database, sunk that immediately from our head at Salesforce, et cetera. So it really actually does a great job in aligning sales and marketing and getting building confidence and goodwill. Um, and from there, really, I mean, Shannon's in the, in the room. She runs our ABM program on the marketing side. But I mean, there's constant dialogue between marketing ops, sales ops, SDRs, inbound SDRs, outbound SDRs, sales management, myself, uh, our CRO, et cetera. And so it really is a team-based effort. There was just a chain, an email chain earlier today about uh, someone was talking to an influencer marketing network and they're like, who are the customers that are in this influencer market? And my customer marketer jumped in, went through a little database. These are the five, you know, product marketing jumped in. We'll make a slide on that. We will add this to the, this and that. And so it's sales and marketing in real time engaging. And um, without a target account approach, we wouldn't have had that type of trust and relationship and kind of collaboration. So there's a collaborative effort between sales and marketing to target the accounts. And then from there, there's a, a, a cohesive strategy that comes out of it. One of, the, uh, one of the interesting experiments that I've done in a couple of different organizations as a marketer, and I remember I did this once, we had a, a great year uh, from a marketing perspective in terms of demand gen, hit all of our targets from a lead perspective, and I was with a group of salespeople, and I was really excited because finally, we were gonna get our due, and I said, raise your hand if you got a lead from marketing this quarter. Nobody raised their hand. And I said, where are all these leads going? We had the best quarter ever, and nobody got a lead. And what I realized, I've also had the chance to sell, is that it's not so much that salespeople aren't getting leads. There's a different mindset, and there's a different way to view the world. In fact, I joke around that marketers view the world as a funnel, and salespeople view the world as a pipeline, and they can't even agree on which direction or orientation their business is, is lining up. So as a marketer, you say, you know, you're waiting for a pat on the back for all these leads that you delivered, and the salespeople are saying, I have no leads. So regardless of how effective the lead generation is and, and how much that's being monetized, I think there also needs to be a lot of direct interaction on issues that both sellers and marketers care about. So account prioritization is one great example. I've got a really pedestrian example as well. Um, in a world where content is king, Salespeople oftentimes are very intimidated by social platforms because it means putting together a long form blog post. That means taking a lot of time, organizing yourself, writing. And for a lot of salespeople, they feel less comfortable in the written world than they do in the spoken world. We ran an experiment at LinkedIn where we said, these, these sales professionals are having amazing conversations every day with experts in the field as they engage in, in the daily selling process. What if we had them record some of these conversations? And so we invited them on your next call, just record it. Pick a topic that you want to talk about, record it, and then send it to the marketing team. We outsourced it, and we got a long form post coming back from the recording of that conversation, which we then sent to the sales team. And then the sellers took that, maybe personalized a little bit with their own uh, flavor or language, and they posted that on social media. It was amazing the kind of reception that they got. Number one, it was an authentic piece. They felt like it had come from them because it was actually their interview. Number two, it was incredibly easy for them and for us. 
And number three, it really showcased the fact that we were working together as partners. Added benefit for marketing, we suddenly got to see all of these customers and prospects profile and screen them, which was a great input from a case study perspective. And also, there were a number of speakers that came out of that because we could actually hear them talking and articulating points. So I think there are a lot of opportunities like that based on things that we're already doing to find synergies and to, to collaborate in that respect. All right, so uh, Matt, I'll come back to you now. You had talked about this ambiguity around what ABM is. You obviously refined your thinking on the topic. It's surely been a journey for you as it has for all of us. If you were to go back in time and kind of rebuild the ABM strategies that you've been running, or, or maybe give advice to someone who's building an ABM strategy for the first time, what advice would you give and, and, and where would you focus? Um, yeah, so I mean, one, it's, it's about jumping in and getting started. I think uh, a lot of people, you know, I think we're used to in, in, as marketers kind of testing and slowly rolling things out. And I think, you'd, you, you know, Sangram talked about this during his speech, you know, you got to be brave. You just got to go for it. Uh, account selection, I think, is probably the trickiest part of ABM. Maybe not overall the trickiest part, but it's a, it's a non-starter if you can't get it right. So if you're nailing your account selection piece and you're saying to yourself, well, hey, like if I picked 100 target accounts and they were all great, and if I ran an ABM campaign and just one engaged with me, then I'd be thrilled about that, right? These are all the accounts that we really want to sell to. So if, if you start from that position, then I think you're always in a great place because you know, when you're running traditional demand gen, if you're running, you know, a program around an offer or, you know, come test out our product or come see us at a thing. And, you know, if people raise their hand and say yes, but if they're at a company that's not a good fit, then none of that even mattered, right? And in fact, it's actually detrimental to your business because it drives a deeper wedge between sales and marketing. So, you know, when you're, when you're running ABM campaigns or just even account-centric campaigns where you're, you're thinking about the accounts before you, you launch a campaign, when you get results back and your sales team is like, yes, I really want to sell to this business. They're a perfect fit for us. That's really where the magic of ABM starts. And I think for a lot of people, they will you know, just mail out a, a coffee mug or something like that to a group of a companies. A pizza box. Uh, you know, you know, an unfortunate pizza box. <laughs> uh, and and you know, someone says yes, and it's the wrong person. And then your AEs are like, well, what are you even doing this mm -hmm. for? Right? This just kind of feels like regular marketing, but with a direct mail component. So I think you know, for, for, for people as one, ABM isn't just about sending direct mailers. I think a lot of people are kind of stuck in that place. Uh, ABM is, is it's really about you know, engaging with accounts that your salespeople actually want to sell to. And when you do that, they will totally buy into it. Awesome. Uh, Rob, your last piece of advice on, uh, on aspiring account-based marketers? Yeah, um, the uh, I think I think the a lot of marketers look at ABM as a series of demand gen programs and just turning on a bunch of things that spend money and that focus on target account lists, building out your database, really getting aligned with sales, talking with sales about how you orchestrate this flow. Um, it's a lot of that stuff actually doesn't cost all that much money, um, and wait to spend the money on the programmatic part once you got the kind of core middle piece. So it's jumping in, but jumping in in the right way where you have the infrastructure that when your CEO says, what's the ROI on this, you have an answer. Um, otherwise, you can actually short fuse your whole long-term ABM strategy because you spent a lot of money, and now the whole kind of initiative is tarnished a little bit, so. Great. All right, Ty, last word, bring it okay. home. Okay, yes. I just want to underscore the point you made, which was, and the point saying Underscore made. away. Yes, I will. Let's so, talk about me. Let's talk about that. So, <laughs> so seriously, we, it's just jump in and get started. I think that's the biggest takeaway is do something. I think we're still in a space where we're in its early adopter phase, where there's an opportunity for all of us as marketers to, to step in and kind of own a particular place with your ABM strategy. So I think there's a lot of opportunity. It's time to just jump in and get started. Uh, as you're thinking about getting started, make sure that you have the alignment, the buy-in, consider what are the limitations of your team. So assess the strengths of your team and start to look at how do I close the gap and getting people up to speed, find mentors within your team, have weekly stand-ups to start sharing the knowledge around that. If you need to start thinking about outsourcing to get started or hiring in talent, 
think about that, but really the time to act is now, because I, I don't know if you agree, I think we're still in this early adoption phase for account-based marketing. Yeah, so. Well, Rob, Matt, and Ty, thank you so much for your insights. Mm -hmm. It's been a great panel, great discussion, and thank you to all of you for a great day, and uh, best of luck in your account-based marketing efforts. Thank you. Um, that was amazing. Uh, uh, so I'm going to just wrap us up. Only another hour and a half, I swear, and we're out of here. Um, but just a, a couple things, and I thought, um, thank you guys. I think, like, can we give them another round of applause? That was pretty uh, a great way to end the day, so thank you. Um, I came away with a bunch today, but there's a few that I thought were important. Um, first of all, Justin, who's our VP of Marketing, hates I heart ABM, so um, sorry, Justin, we didn't get that approved by you. Um, two, it's Liz's birthday on Wednesday, so let's not forget that, and it's also Valentine's Day, so do something nice for yourself as well as whoever else is in your life. Um, and the Olympics are super important, so I'm serious about this. Like, I'm, I'm total geek about the Olympics, but, but there's a piece to the Olympics that brings everyone together, and, you know, it's not always easy to do what we do. The world is not an always easy place to live in. Um, but when we can find these beacons of light that help draw us together, make us think about things outside of our own madness that's right here, it's worthwhile. So spend a little time doing that. Back to the conference. Um, we have drinks on the 17th floor and some food, which I think everyone would be super excited about that. In order to do that and join us out on the roof deck, you have to go down to the lobby Find a LinkedIn person. They might have a pin or a LinkedIn thing, and they're going to escort you to the 17th floor. Um, if you don't do that, someone's going to tackle you and not let you into the building. Um, there's like, yeah, some goons over there I think might tackle you if you try and get by them. Um, but go down to the 17th floor. It'll be pretty obvious where you need to go. Um, the one thing that, that, uh, that came up over and over again was being brave and taking some intelligent risk. It, it, it's, a, it's a fundamental principle here at LinkedIn as well, taking intelligent risk, knowing what you're doing, what you're marketing, and going for it. Um, again, in a reasonable way. You don't want to blow up the building, right? But you want to be able to focus your efforts on what you're doing. There's a bunch of companies here who can help you do it. We can help you do it. But you have to take that next step. You have to be the ones who do something with this information. So I hope you do. I hope you go away, think about this, percolate, have a few drinks, just a few, have some cheese, not a lot, and then think about, uh, <laughs> think about everything we learned today and how we can bring it into our daily lives. And thank you all to the incredible partner team who helped pull this off and our speakers and panelists. So thank you. Thank you all. And there's a survey, so please fill out the survey. I mentioned there were drinks, right? So please fill out the survey uh, on your way out so we can continue doing these and get better and better at them. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. <laughs>